Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 532, featuring an interview with the Broken Roads developer, Mr. Craig Ritchie. And a lot of us would like uh, to be in that situation where we release uh, an indie game, it does fabulous, makes lots of money, gets a lot of uh, great attention, and <laughs> we become superstars overnight. <laughs> I mean, sure, who wouldn't want that, right? Uh, but what about uh, somebody who, you know, you, you do your best, you put the game out, and then it gets really slammed by all the uh, mainstream uh, reviews in ways you think is, is unfair or premature. You, you try to do updates and patches to fix the uh, the issues and deal with all the criticism, but you know eventually it just seems overwhelming and you start to question everything. Uh, well, if you ever wonder what that experience is like, <laughs> you definitely want to stay tuned because uh, we really get uh, a really frank discussion here uh, of a game that uh, admittedly uh, could have had a better launch, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it, does it deserve the amount of hate uh, that it received? Uh, that's the question. Uh, anyway, this was a really fascinating conversation, very philosophical uh, uh, conversation with Mr. Uh, Ritchie. So uh, without further ado then, here is Craig Ritchie. Looks like you got a lot of, uh, is that books or games back there? What are we? Uh, right behind me over here, top row, Dune 2, Street of Might and Magic 3. Baldur's Gate through to Icewind Dale 2, most of the gold box games, Questron 2. You got the gold box games, back. Oh, man, like, big fan. Bottom is mostly Might and Magic, Heroes, Arcanum, Ultima, Ultima Underworld, Original Ultima 4, Ultima 7. Holy shit. There's about, I don't know, 200 Dragonons, Forgotten Realms, Asimov, Clark, stuff you can't see. And then over there, an almost full collection of every... Fighting Fantasy and Lone Wolf game, uh, oh, game book. Fighting Fantasy books too? Oh, man, I can't really. God. But yes, I think I've got a nearly full collection except for the like. Are those all from like the back in the day games that you picked up as a kid or your collector or what? Oh, no, I, I was reading them honestly as like 12, 13 years old. Are you talking about these games or the game yeah. books? I mean, yes. <laughs> well, no, both of them. I mean, so, some of these I've had for... I don't know, 35 years or, or, or more. And then others, it's like picked up from a collector's group where it's like, oh, I'd love to have that again. I mean, this this Christmas, I've, what you can't see there is Shadows of Undren Tide, which was a Neverwinter Nights expansion, I'm sure you know. Um, and I played the original, but I never had Undren Tide. So that's what I played this Christmas. Uh, so definitely still playing them. Sure. My most recent acquisition, little game you may have heard of as well, no, he did I never, I never completed. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. The back second. in the back in the day, the first one, I don't know how many hours I sunk into. So I will be playing I've the Beholder two with all seeing eye and whatever, and you know, still love those old classics. You played the original Dungeon Master game from F2. the um. I, like I didn't have that. I mean, I I know it for sure. I didn't have that. I think I've got Dungeon Master two lying down there. Um, but no, I think that was like just just before I got a computer that can handle that kind of thing. So my first real first person or you know, blobber or whatever you want to call it would have been Bard's Tale 3. Um, which well, I didn't you. know what I was doing. I <laughs> had no clue. Uh, but the one I, I got fully was Eyes of a Holder One and then Might and Magic Three. Those were those like were phenomenal. You know, little, I don't know, 12 year old me, 11 year old me. You know, this is the kind of thing I like to hear from an RPG developer. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be disappointed if it was all crappy games. And I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, we were having a conversation in, in the studio. It was like, do any of you remember Castle of the Winds, um, Warlords 3? Oh, so, you know, Castle I think Ca Castle of the Winds, give, give that a quick look. Um, Rogue man, Rogue. I mean, Microsoft. We we really did have a walk down memory lane recently that included like the original Rogue and um, Fantasy PH Fantasy. Oh yeah, I had that Douglas uh, Wood. I had him on the show not too long ago. That's one of the wins, huh? This one's new to me, so it's kind of a roguelike from the yeah, yeah. Exactly. It was probably, look, other than actual ASCII Rogue, uh, when we got this, I, I, you know, when you you play a new genre for the first time, like I remember when I played King's Quest 2, 
It was the first Sierra game I played. And it's just like, until then, you know, Mario goes from left to right, or you can go up and down through screens, you can do all these things. And then King's Quest 2, I remember playing it and I was like walking home from my friend's house with my sister and I was just saying like, you can do anything. You can go anywhere. You can say anything. You type, you know, um, Castle of the Winds was, was, had this, I think it was my first real experience of this roguelike where you can do things over and over and over and try these different things. So you, you see a new genre for the first time that gets your brain ticking over of like what, what's actually possible in this, in this medium, you know? And I think we're going back to like 1990 or 1991 when I, when I first had my mind blown by those games, you know, L a little later, I'm originally from South Africa. It was not as easy to get games back then you could get you could get the originals but pretty much everyone was just like you know sharing floppy disks in the playground and oh. um copying games and that kind of thing a little piracy no just just a terrible pirates growing up you know so you so we get like one or two games a year Africa, like, and then you moved to australia yeah so i've been in australia for about seven years now um yeah about seven and a half years yeah, it's always yeah, one but... the game development scene was like there. Was it? I guess you probably know more about South Africa, South Africa than back in the day. How hard it was to get computers and what platforms were popular. And yeah, all that sort Look, of thing. We, we we didn't have any like official Sega or Nintendo presence for quite a long time. Everyone had the it was you know the most popular one was called Golden China. It was basically the 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 NES or the Famicom pirated version. And it was so popular, you'd get it like, you know, advertised on TV and in every shop and whatever, just, you know, pi piracy just kind of reigned supreme. Huh. Um, but it, it started emerging in the late 80s, early 90s. And you'd get, you know, people that I, I, I worked Saturday mornings in a computer shop and you get people that would come in with their, like a cardboard box full of originals and then you would just sort of choose what are you what are you buying and i remember the guy had ultima 6 the one year and a whole load of uh sierra titles and that so it did start to emerge i'd say early 90s that it was more and more possible to get an original uh, but you'd more find that like okay i'm gonna get colonel's request and you get space coast 3 and you get this and then we we would all end up having those games um, once a bunch of friends had, had acquired a, uh, a new original. Well, that is excellent stuff. Mm. You know, I thought I don't usually drink a beer during these things. <laughs> Please do. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, appropriate. So given, given a broken road, you know, I thought <laughs> it's not a Foster's, but fantastic. What is it? Wow, this is a uh, s'mores dark brew. S'mores. Yeah, it tastes kind of like s'mores. <laughs> okay, enjoy, enjoy. Well, I need to get some, some good Australian appropriate accompaniment. Do you have any recommendations for me when I'm shopping for my next beer? Jeez, uh, I would say the the one of the best is the Stone and Wood Pale Ale. Um, give that a try if that's if that's your thing. I've got um, Stone and Wood. Stone and Wood. Um, <laughs> I got many recommendations. The beers. The beers in in Broken Roads are, um, you know, legally distinct but familiar enough takes on some of the more popular beers. Some are like kind of mass market popular. Um, there's one called um, Moon Dog Old Mate, uh, which in the game I think is Sun Cat Young Mate. So that's pretty good as well. What's it called? Um, oh, there's there's so many little craft breweries over here. Oh my goodness! And yeah, people might think this is unrelated, but they have no. no they obviously, haven't played related. the game if they think this is not related. <laughs> and we, we've—I don't know how far you've gotten into Broken Roads if you've like found the brewery, but there is, of course, a brewery in there. And um, I'm on the, like third chapter. Okay. Well, if the world's opened up and you can explore the the world map, brewery in there? I haven't found that oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Did I have to? I might not leave that. Uh, yeah, this is only this is the first time I ever played. I've done a little bit of de uh, design work on these, just playing around. You know, one thing that always fascinated me was the sound effects. So you're trying to find just the right sound effect for something like when you level up, you want something mm -hmm. that you know sounds great. And you know, like World of Warcraft has that famous you know certain chime sound. Uh, but I think you are have beat them all. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's that's old I, I won't spoil uh, it for anybody that hasn't played yeah. the game, but as soon as you hear it, you'll be like, oh yeah. <laughs> I know what I'm playing. <laughs> There's a bunch of little touches like that that we, you know, we hope people appreciate and enjoy. You know, sounds like you did. <laughs> well, let's let's back up a little bit for people that maybe haven't heard of the game before. Don't I don't know what it's about. I mean, I assume they would would have heard about it before, if not. You've heard about it now. <laughs> Broken <laughs> roads. Yeah, can you tell me just a quick summary, like how this game came about, and you know what you were going for? What were the uh, what what's the differences between this and similar sorts of games? Sure, sure. So, man, this was early 2019, and um, yeah, speaking to a longtime friend who's, you know, his. Both of our favorite games of all time was Baldur's Gate 2. Um, played games together plenty, you know, have very similar taste in games. And we spoke about starting our own studio. Um, we were going to make sort of like a road trip across some indistinct, it wasn't Australia, a post-apocalyptic kind of uh, Oregon Trail style game um with random encounters and combat and and all that kind of thing and the more we started talking about it the more we like wanted to flesh out the characters flesh out the world and you know within the first i don't know six weeks or so we decided you know we just keep on describing a more sort of fallout Baldur's gate style rpg like let's just make that and we committed that we were going to make a um like a post-apocalyptic rpg and have a lot of fun with it came up with the idea of, of the moral compass which we chat about in a moment uh yeah, and then it was like hey let's actually set this in australia like you know let's set this as a journey across all of australia and then the more we dug into it it was like you know there's so much you can do just in western australia let's let's limit it to there and then if this turns into success we can always do other parts of the country other parts of the world whatever it is um so it's really a uh contemporary australian you know take on fallout one and two boulders gate you know pillars of eternity two much more recently obviously um i'd say pillars two was my favorite rpg of I don't know, the last 10 years or something like that so yeah it was the traditional isometric no, uh, party based wasteland dialogue. Two three, you play those oh yeah yeah no for sure but i think this this came out after wasteland two or wasteland two just come out um and launched maybe you know wasteland 3 sort of launched midway through our development yeah. yeah i love the fact that it's in australia i mean to me the more i think about it that makes so much sense because i don't know about other people but my first exposure to this post-apocalyptic thing was mad max <laughs> yeah. like i've watched those movies enough i can pretty much quote them <laughs> totally. Totally. You know, the road we, and thunderdome we, i mean it's absolutely just, just awesome classics stuff. classics being able to bring it back here, we we actually like the studio where, where I am now is about 20 minutes away from where they film some of the scenes and less than an hour, maybe 45 minutes drive is a town called Little River, which is the main town that you get in the first Mad Max movie. Um, so that's all like right around. Oh, so that's uh, a real town, based, I guess. You know, um, <laughs> Mad Max 2 is in, it's filmed in another state, um, you know, the much more drier much more you know mad max 2 is probably the closest comparable like we were putting together sort of a brand document in the game bible and so on and mad max 2 which i'm sure is the case with you know fallout and many others um that mad max 2 is sort of we are we wanted our level of degradation of society and madness like the, the way this world has fallen apart to be situated somewhere between mad max 1 and mad max 2 because uh, you can always about, ramp it up. Mad Max Two is in the Road Warrior or Thunderdome. Yeah. No Road Warrior. Road Road Warrior. Warrior. So we we thought Mad Max, you know, uh, Beyond Thunderdome is Mad Max Three. Yeah. Uh, so you. we <laughs> we between Mad Max and the Road Warrior. Oh, that's a, perfect. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, also the one of the things I loved about those movies too was just you get a little bit of the Australian. You know, I remember the first version. It's, it's horrible to remember this. <laughs> But I had a version of Mad Max. I used to think the first movie sucked. And the reason was that the only version I had seen was this terrible dubbed version where they'd gone in and replaced uh, yes. Australian 
original Australian voices with these like American dubs. It was like, what is this? <laughs> when I finally heard the original mm. uh, voices in there, I'm like, oh my God, this movie is awesome. I, it's one of my favorite movies now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. So I actually imagine? haven't watched the new Furiosa yet, but but very keen. Yeah, I've uh, seen that. Yeah. It's excellent. Do you have a favorite uh, of the whole uh, franchise? My favorite is Road Warrior for sure. Like, <laughs> instantly we're on the same uh, i thought that <laughs> furioso well, not furioso yet yes i thought that um uh was it called the, the one with charlie's Theron, the, the new one mad max fury road fury road yeah it's like furioso and then like i thought it was fury Sock road like the, the, new, like this, the previous one was absolutely brilliant it's probably you know second in the list for me it's just it's such a good movie but there's not much like uh, the Road Warrior, unless you, you know, maybe know um, a boy and his dog, by any chance. Yeah, I've read the the novel, saw the movie. It's been a while. It's mm. kind of a little bit. Uh, it's almost kind of a comedic angle to that one, right? The... It's got a little bit of absurdity, definitely, and I think you can see a very close tie to the you know, Fallout One and Two in a boy and his dog. Um, that. You know. People watching this, if you haven't seen it and you're interested in Poster Park, the boy and his dog is very good. It's very, well, it's, and it is five. So that was before. I mean, maybe it's comedic, but I found it more. It's it's weird. It's yeah. It's absurd. It's uh. It's also dark. It's very dark. Um, the dog could, talk or something. But he's telepathic. That I don't recall. He has um, telepathic dog. There you go telepathic dog. Um, I more remember the. There's almost like this. Yeah, there you go, Harlan Ellison. I rather um, Ellison. There's Bob. scenes in that 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 it's radical, but it's it's good. It's a very very good movie, you know. Yeah, I remember liking it. It's just I don't remember. It's been so long. I don't remember all the details. Mm. But I think I try to, I try to watch every movie have... that fits this. You know, like Damnation Alley's another one I really yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Of course, uh, the what's the one with the cars and Sylvester Stallone? Um, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, he's like not the, a death race. Not yeah, death, death race two thousand or something like that. Cool. Yeah, there's there's a lot of them. Yeah, um, the Escape from New York movies. and oh, um, <laughs> that one. Another classic <laughs> called Canticle for Leibowitz. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, so Colin McComb, I'd never read it. Colin McComb actually said, um, when he joined, hey, I should I should give that a read. Um. It's a, you know, there's so much to draw on. Um, and you find, oh, Fallout, you know, whether it was Brian Fargo or, or whoever was working the original Fallout, they, they clearly knew about that as well. Or they got there first or, you know, we'll just rip it wholesale from what they did in Fallout 2. Oh, yeah. But that's it. It's a fun, there's, there's another one I haven't read yet. It's sitting over there called, um, oh, man, Roadside Picnic. I was just going to mention that, Roadside Picnic. Cool. Cool. So only after it was like closer to launch, I think somebody recommended that. So I, I managed to get the book. There's uh, a two guy brothers. I about I interviewed a guy in Cased. Have you seen that yeah. game? Yeah, that's yeah, based yeah, on totally. that. Or similar. Totally. I don't know if it's based on that story, but it's definitely uh, yeah. it's hard not to be influenced by the grades that have come before. You know. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's no, for sure. <laughs> if you got sure. these are great, you know, films and stories. I mean, why yeah, would you want shoulders wanna... of giants and all that? You know, yeah, I think that's where Hollywood goes wrong when they try to mess too much with, you know, what what works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, we could talk for hours about that. I'm sure. You know. Well, let's get it a little bit more into a, a the uh, Broken Roads game. You know, one of the things I saw mentioned repeatedly. Trying to get a picture of it here. Was you're really trying to do something different with uh, the uh, what you might think of as an alignment? Yeah, know, evil, awful, evil. You know, we've seen that kind of thing. I've, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of uh, I've been on Twitter a few times. Like, I don't even know why we even have these systems anymore. They're kind of weird, usually, and sometimes, and at the worst, uh, they actually detract. I think from mm -hmm. uh, some of the gameplay. You know, I'm not sure what they've really added. Uh, but so I'm always like, can we do something different? Can we figure out what's broken with this you know, alignment mm -hmm. system? So I really appreciate uh, how deep you've dived uh, into this 
Thanks. Uh, mechanic. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your approach to this. Sure. Look, just really just wanted to do something different here that was like, and, and you've mentioned Twitter, this design literally like seeing the way people speak to each other on Twitter, seeing the way people communicate on social media, the sort of, I need to reduce my um, opponent to a one dimensional caricature of something uh, is like, it's awful. Like social media has, has made the world worse. They're all you know, a bunch in of my opinion, it's no nihilist. question. <laughs> it's, it's narcissistic nihilist kind of dehumanizing. I'm, I'm there's no human at the end of my, now I can insult this person be as horrible as I want because they're just, they're just words on a screen. Um, and playing the, you know, D and D games since G two or 2.5, you know, the lawful evil, like you said, um, uh, you know, chaotic evil through lawful good. Um, and wanted to do something that reacted, responded a little bit more. So that golden arc that's on the screen now, the idea was to have something that encompasses your worldview where people are made up of a lot of different things. And there's a light, a brighter illuminated area at the center. So those are all like low level questions you could make in other quadrants. Like you are able to conceive of something evil or something that may go against your nature or in that moment, it might suit you better. It might suit your, your ends. You're feeling particularly generous. You're feeling particularly selfish, whatever. So inside of um, uh, the golden arc that's there, that your worldview, you can, you can pick any, dialogue choices that appear within there or within the illuminated uh the bright illuminated parts at the center of the of the moral compass um and it was really just like what is some uh, areas of say moral philosophy um or just philosophy in general that because you know that was my educational background i studied that to a a postgrad level, and I was thinking in a post-apocalyptic world, you no, can set up. That does not surprise me to hear that, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> um, Colin Colin McComb as well also studied philosophy, so we had some really good um, conversations, and you know, it's just it's a super interesting. Um, uh, in my, you know, obviously, my opinion, way to explore moral quandaries and ethical dilemmas and thought experiments set up a situation in a lawless world where you know the 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 police or the laws or the the idea the, the things that kind of would protect us in the bounds and the fear of being uh held to account by the state you know is not a thing so now it's purely about what you believe is right and wrong or acting in your own self-interest or the greater good or whatever post-apocalyptic world suits that really really well so what I wanted to do was come up with something where it's, you know, cliched. I've said this a hundred times by now, the, the light side, dark side of, you know, the force, the renegade paragon in, in mass effect all worked great, like really, really cool stuff. But there's got to be something a little bit more where you're not between two poles, you know? Um, and so when you make a decision within the moral compass, it rotates at a, a few degrees depending on... So if you see where those dots are in relation to your worldview, how close they are to the size, the, the, the borders of the worldview on the left or the right, that increases the, the amount of degrees it will rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. If you oh. choose something from your moral tendencies which are outside of your worldview, it'll rotate even further. Whereas if you choose a lot within your worldview, the borders actually narrow the outer edge gets a bit closer to the ed edge of the moral compass. So you can start to become like narrow minded, but then you get to make choices that are closer uh, to the end. there, like more sort of at a higher level. They're not different levels, but it's zero to a hundred from the start of the moral compass to the, to the um, periphery. And those options are only available if you've been consistent in your character. Like, okay, I can get to choose an option that is say, a utilitarian 70. If I've been making choices all over and my moral compass has been swinging around, I haven't been consistent. Hey, I'm a broad-minded person. I've got a lot more options, but I might not have some of those high-level things available to me. Um, it's not perfect. There's still issues. Everyone has, a, has an opinion. And this is cool. I like to see these debates come up. How's that utilitarian? Oh, that's far more nihilist. This 
<laughs> this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This was written by somebody who thinks they're smart, but clearly not. <laughs> you know, this, this the, the the classic internet responses. But it's nice to see people discuss uh, that could really be considered nihilist instead of Machiavellian, or how is that humanist? Um, so yeah, that that's it. It's our attempt at, at an alignment system. It's gotten a lot of attention. Some people love it. Didn't click with everybody. Um, yeah, that's well, it. Yeah, so there are. It's almost not like people are having these philosophical debates, <laughs> you know, which is kind of the purpose. I mean, I just thought it was great. I studied philosophy, cool. you know, quite quite a bit too. So it was a it was a lot of fun to see like philosophical books, yeah, quotes, all the loading screens. It's like the one game where I'm like, I wish that loading screen would last a little bit longer because I still work and I still think I still look thinking about that quotation there from Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 cool. yeah, cool. And he, even that, I mean, if you read some of the reviews that launched, some people were like, it's just it's just weird what what irks people these days and what is people find divisive or difficult. Like some people hate that we have those philosophical quotes. Some of them consider them trivial pursuit level. Oh, questions i mean the response is just like are you kidding me like the awesome. some of the greatest minds in in um you know at least in western philosophy and i, I didn't include philosophy from around the world or think it's from around the world because that's not what i studied and i wasn't going to try and be like sort of all-inclusive expert on things that i don't know about but uh it's it's just weird that some people like i'd rather see kylie minogue song lyrics in there because some of these these things are um i i can't remember i'm just like i'm I'm glad to hear that you kind of like seeing these quotes and it's something to think about um i didn't really think about it but yeah that would be tough you know thinking about which schools and what fits this there must have been cases where you're like i'm not even sure myself where this really fits but <laughs> was it cases there, like there, there were a few there were definitely a few where it's like gee i need to read all of like spinoza or something because i really want to <laughs> dive into humanism in a big way um the plato.edu that you know the stanford website that i think is one of the best philosophical resources on the internet and used a lot top shelf of the you know above all those books uh, excuse me above all those games a couple rows of, of philosophy books from university that i had to dig out again and it was like i know that we are not covering all schools of thought across history across the world that's not the mission we'll never get that right Hopefully people will play and assess broken roads for what it is, as opposed to all the parts they can imagine are missing. Um, you know what I hope yeah. is people who play this and like, oh, that sounds kind of neat, this book. You know, who's this? I want to learn more about, you know, Neil. So that, learn more what about you're talking about is exactly, like I basically said that to people, that's exactly the goal. Like when I played Ultima 6 and 7 as a 12, 13-year-old, that got me interested in the virtues like you know having that manual reading through it reading through those ideas then i think like 16 year old me went and bought a, a full book on the history of philosophy and i read up on these ideas more and more and more and i ended up spending like seven years of my life studying at university all because literally you can trace the like right back to richard garriott introducing me to these ideas in ultima six um and that's exactly what you just said is exactly what i was hoping is like what is that quote? What is this idea? Let me go Google that. You know, yeah. Hopefully, get yeah, people thinking a lot about you and have a sort of a quiz at this when you create your characters that are very uh, Ultima. <laughs> That's. I mean, it is one of them is sort of moral quandaries, um, and then that totally where you fit in. One of them is basically I, I can't remember if it's Ultima five or six, but it's almost word for word. But put into that's a complete throwback. So if you if you are very familiar with the Ultima games, uh, <laughs> you'd have to be very familiar with the character creation of the Ultima games. But one of the questions in Broken Roads is a, a total Easter egg uh, recreation of um, one of the options from. I, I, now I don't recall. Like I said, it was Ultima five or six. But yeah, there's yeah. There's a guy. Have you ever heard of Prof Noctus? Don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, he's a he's got a YouTube channel, but he's a he's a professor of religious studies. Hmm. But he uses uh, Final Fantasy, you know, to teach like more uh, moral philosophies and ethics, and I guess wow. religious stuff. <laughs> he might be a fun person to talk to. <laughs> oh, that's that's cool. I'll have to. Be look a curious up. mistake would be would be on, on yeah. this. Yeah, for there's sure. A lot of yeah. I mean, we're, there's so many philosophies. I guess you could have included. 
Mm. We we originally had existentialism instead of humanism, but I found that a little too limiting, uh, especially if you if you do know Sartre and you know one of the um, oh, writings is existentialism no people. Oh. is a humanism. Yeah, so we we kind of expanded it more because humanism incorporates and includes a whole lot of things of of being good without the need to appeal to you know received religion and religious doctrines to get your moral code basically so things like Immanuel Kant and Baruch Spinoza and and you know the way how to live good so you know humanism core humanism would be our lawful good basically um and I don't think existentialism quite captured that, whereas humanism can still incorporate existentialism. So there's been a few tweaks along the way, for sure. There wasn't any discussion of, was it a, I'm trying to remember, is it objectivism? Is that a Ayn Rand? Uh, Ayn Rand? Ayn Rand. <laughs> I was yeah. get her name wrong. Ayn Rand. Yeah, she's... Is she still kind of popular with the graduate students? And... Oh, like, look, I, I thought she had some... Uh, I think she made a big contribution. Like that's it. Like you make a contribution, and then if the ideas are oh, appalling, decades later, it's like oh, it's so. Well, think of what she's said, and the you know that she's made the world worse because of capitalism. It's like just learn critical thinking. That one safeguard against bad ideas. And then if you disagree with Ayn Rand, the existence of her ideas being out there in the world is not really going to cause you harm. You know. Um, there's man, Ayn Rand has come up in, in in discussions over the last four years while we've been writing. I can't think of something in the game right now um, that is a direct, you know, that directly comes from objectivism. No, um, semi spoilery territory, but this is kind of out there now. The the main city, chapter four. Once you get inside Kalgoorlie. That whole thing was constructed as a uh, kind of bad reading of Plato's Republic. So the entire Kalgoorlie is a, which is a real mining city here in Australia, uh, is what would happen if somebody were to establish a city, or at least a city-state, based upon Plato's Republic, warts and all. Um, the philosopher kings and the... 100%. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. exactly. Well, exactly. that's it's a good uh a good hook to keep me on <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. it's hell getting into that city man i've been working on that for hours trying to uh, well you, you're in so i mean i think there's some stuff we've got to balance on the game and we've just had george zietz and 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 olga yeah, must have got to talk about him at some point because he's sure, pretty sure. he's a new guy yeah, right new, absolutely new, new team. um so, you know, something's wrong about the way we've communicated that quest um, because chapter three, where you are, is meant to be the the big open world portion of the game. And I think that we sort of dialed up the urgency too much of getting into Kalgoorlie. Like that's what you're supposed to do, but you're meant to have, you know, a fun 15 to 20 hours exploring the world and, you know, the quests and the towns and the characters are meant to send you through them and then you start unlocking all the side quests or oh there's four different ways through i'm going to kind of abandon the current you know i'm getting in as a scientist oh but i visited lake deborah which is this town based upon like philosophy and so on the settlement i kind of like that adventure more i'm gonna gonna try and pursue the philosophical path uh that's what we sort of intended for chapter three um but it sounds even like your experience I just want to get into Kalgoorlie now. You know, I need to progress the main quest. It's like, okay, we, like we need to... Do you need to do all the items? Or is it just you need to do a certain number of the... You need to do one... You need there, There's four different paths. And then within those paths, there's different routes. And one of them requires, like the mercenary path, requires doing multiple things to satisfy the gatekeeper at Kalgoorlie. Whereas the other ones, you if you complete sort of the main quest of the core settlements, because there's one settlement that represents trade, one that represents philosophy, one that represents science and research, and then there's the more general sort of military or mercenary path. And if you do the main quests of 
one of those three towns you can get in, or if you do a combination of enough things to satisfy the mercenary slash military entry, they let you in as well. Oh, okay, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm probably closer than I think, because <laughs> I've done most of the philosophy. I was working in the. Okay. Like, yes, I've got it up. Is that what it's called? I might be getting the name wrong. Lake Deborah. So the silo community. They built up on, on yeah. the, the old grain silos with the lift and the library and the workshop. That, gathering up all the philosophy books. I mean, cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, Let me know like if you need, if you need a hand that. finding like, how can any. You complain <laughs> about this quest. I mean, this is awesome. You're, you're going. You're, this is what I would do. I mean, in this situation, I mean, my mm -hmm. thought would be exactly. We got to go out and find the, all these copies of these books and preserve them somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it absolutely yeah. makes sense to me. So, just it's just a dumb fetch quest, Matt. Like you know, that's that's. Well, if you got to be fetching something, at least it's something you. Can no, I'm I'm kidding. I'm just surprised by you know we're still getting reviews mixed everything from a nine out of ten to like a three out of ten. So like we got the definition of mixed reviews where it's like oh too many fetch quests. And I'm like cool, but what about like the conversation that you have about I don't know. Machiavelli with the uh, aspirational, you know, the woman who wants to climb to a slightly higher status. You can only have that conversation once you've found and read, you know, the Prince or Discourses on Levy or whatever, once you've done that. So, like, sure, you're fetching a thing, uh, <laughs> but it opens up dialogue options in a narrative driven game. Um, yeah, just we've made a game. We hope people have fun with it. Um, it sounds like you know. It sounds like you are. So that's great. Yeah, let's let's try to address that a little bit. This the sort of initial reaction because that was one of the that's sort of what I don't know how bad it's has it been a problem, you know. But anyway, I had a question, a couple of questions mm -hmm. sent from some of my viewers sure. actually about that. Miko, uh, so let me ask the maybe we'll, we'll give a little background after I ask the yeah. question. It says, how did they manage to keep up the good spirits after the game was rather coldly received at launch? Yeah. And what did they focus on to improve it? Uh, there's another question kind of related to that, but yeah, so maybe we could just sort of back up. <laughs> so what happened? Yeah. So you put this you put this game out and got hit with all the that was it how bad was it, I guess? Um it it was lower. It was worse than anything we we expected. Uh, sales were below any publisher forecast that we saw. You know, this this game has had a very, very bumpy road from um, inception through to launch. You know, we've we've changed publishers a couple of times. Like right before Christmas versus Evil, our, our publisher you might have seen the news that everyone was was terminated there and the brand persisted under ownership of, of of tiny build the game was delayed a few times we had signed and were with team 17 back in like 2020 2021 uh that didn't work out either and most of the details are firmly sealed away behind ndas um worms. so it's just, sorry those are the guys that did worms if i recall correctly yeah worms and oh look a whole lot more since, uh, but yeah, wor Worms is the the probably what most people will remember Team Seventeen for, um, and we started with very very little, you know, a, a bit of our own funding, and then slowly building up. And you know, living in Australia, we have uh, grant funding, certain state grant funding and federal funding. So we managed to get things off the ground, get a demo together, build up the hype. Uh, we originally wanted to launch this in April, twenty twenty one. So that shows you like <laughs> three years after the initial desired launch date. Um, and it was it wasn't it wasn't easy, you know, making a, a big game like this. At one point we'd all the art in the game was done by the Shadowrun Returns team, the same, the same artists who did that series of games. And then we moved everything into 3D. Uh, so that delayed things as well. And then we changed development teams as well midway through when we got a different publisher. So there was a lot of behind the scenes disruptions. It doesn't excuse what we launched. And if we launched an unsatisfying product, we launched an unsatisfying product. Uh, it got delayed. It was very difficult launch for us. Like we, we had a few things on the day of launch that I think hurt us more. Uh, number one was a video went out that was like, oh, this game, I finished it in seven hours. 
And it was like that immediately everyone just jumped on that. Like, how how is this game only seven hours? I've been working on it for five years, like whatever. And the YouTuber has since come and said, hey, no, I finished it in seven hours. That is my play style. The game's much longer. Uh, but that that really stuck. And people just like couldn't understand why, why is this game so short? All our internal play testing, our closed beta tests, our QA testers, we specifically had them playing as players. It crossed the 30-hour mark with the, our QA testers and the um, community test testers were closer to like 20 to 25. So that that really hurt us. People had a perceived value. Um, like how they're charging $50. I'm at six hours and I'm only on the third chapter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, it's it is much longer than that. There's four hundred and forty thousand words in it, four origin stories, many ways through the game. It's it's not a seven hour game, even though you can finish it in like six and a half hours. I think is the shortest YouTube video I've seen. Um, but then it was buggy at launch as well. There were there were a lot of quest problems. I mean, you know, big RPGs have had difficult launches in the past. Uh, you know, there's so many examples. All you name it. You had a lot. I mean, you name it. Like, like uh, Warhammer. Arcanum. Yep. Oh, man. You know, totally. And Cyberpunk and um, the new Warhammer game and original what Pathfinder Kingmaker. Like, there's so many examples where these games are so complex. And even if you've got, like, 20 people doing QA, as soon as it's out there in the wild and there's 1,000, 2,000 people playing it, they're going to find issues that you don't. And what really sucks is when you have a reviewer that encounters issue after issue. Um, and then they fairly post a negative review about it, as in like, a, you know, major IGN gave us like a four out of 10, uh, which is really difficult to to go like, gee, this game's like a four. Like I could see with the bugs and the issues, like I was expecting things would be in the high sixes at launch and we'd be able to turn it around to a seven or an eight. Uh, the other thing that hurt really badly was apparently the the russian and chinese localization was not very good quality at, at launch we have since patched and, and fixed that up so steam got massively like massive amount of fair negative reviews in chinese or russian about the localization quality so that obviously affects first impressions land in the game mo uh, game page on steam mostly negative or mixed reviews i'm moving on uh, there was a lot of negative reviews from players that were completely fair. Cool, let's take this. Let's take on the feedback. Let's patch it. We've had two major patches since launch. We, you know, if you look at the recent reviews, it's gone from, you know, mostly negative to mixed to to mostly positive to very positive. You know, yeah, so um, on the recent, uh, yeah, but un reviews. if you look at the mix, like unfortunately, that guy on the left. You know that that's the launch version. Uh, that that one there, seven hundred now, eight hundred people found this review helpful. Um, that's that's going to be tough to to get past because that's posted on day one. We've had a hot fix. We've had a major patch, like ten thousand more words, plus another patch was just released two days ago. Um, I do think over time, if more and more people give the game a chance and play it, they'll go like, "There's there is actually something here." you know, that's enjoyable. Um, but yeah, it was, look, it was a, it was a, a failed launch. Like your, your community member asked, like, how do we keep the spirits up? Well, you, you don't keep the spirits up at, at all times. I mean, there's been some days that have been like, the only way you can describe it is like a waking nightmare. Like, are you, are you, are you serious? This is what's happened after like five years of work. It's, uh, we, you know, we've had to, have a whole bunch of redundancies here and, and terminate some contracts and reduce the size of our team because we just didn't sell as many copies. And it's like, we failed. Like we had a failed launch. That's a, that's a heavy thing to carry, you know, as, as game director and founder of the studio, I'm, I'm responsible for every single thing that goes in the game. I'm responsible for the launch, for the quality, for, for everything. Um, but those who've been around long enough will know, Hey, when you have a publisher, there's certain things that are publisher responsibilities. There's certain things that are developer responsibilities. Um, that's irrelevant to the player who has paid their 30, 40, you know, depending on your country, $50. And they want a product of a particular level of quality and they didn't get that. So that's my thing to fix. And that's what we've been working super hard to do. And I just hope that 
more people that play the game in its current patch will will post a Steam review to counter the totally fair reviews, like the launch reaction. Um, I'm also going to reach out to some of the the really poor media, like big me, uh, media outlets that gave us such bad reviews at launch and say, are you willing to reconsider like after these patches? Because you're front and center on Metacritic, which is where people look. Um, you didn't give the game a fair go. And you, you know, you may have played it in a patch state. So yeah, re reading the question, hearing the question, how do we keep the spirits up? You just kind of have to. Like we all had some very, very bum days for sure. But then it's like, well, is this is this the end of days? Like, no, we're gonna have to just keep fighting. Like we're just gonna have to keep going. A lot of the stuff is fixable. Um, we've polished and improved a lot. So yeah, man, it's it's maybe not always as rosy as it as it might look. Or, you know, because I, I was surprised by the question, how do they keep the spirits up? Well, we didn't every day. We're human and it was very, very I don't want to say depressing. It was very disappointing. It was challenging. It was extremely difficult those those first couple of weeks at launch and seeing people absolutely tear to shreds what you have put so much into and then going how is this how, you know the gamer giving us eight out of ten and an xbox site giving us nine out of ten and ign is giving us four and rpg site is giving us three and saying like sadly the game itself isn't worth a damn and just going like wow like this isn't just this isn't just a review. This is some, this is like really harsh, you know, having people reach out to me privately on discord or Twitter and going like, is this personal? Like, is this like, why are these people, you know, like really having some What's strange word reactions. Out, I think what happens is, Oh, they, they hear that it's a bad game and Oh, you're supposed to write a bad review. Of this. Totally. Look, there was also a thing... the experience. So that's, this is why I don't want to look at any reviews or anything like that. If I'm going to review a game, I want to go in totally fresh yeah cool i don't want to cool. be contaminated by <laughs> you know anybody's uh, views because i think that absolutely gets that it I gets in your head contaminated might be a good a really good way to say it because that's how i felt like we were tainted by originally having review code sent out in november and while the game was being reviewed the um we decided to delay by four months we just the quality just was not there so some reviewers had already started playing the game and then the pr company and the publisher said hey we're actually delaying and then you know some very high profile people posted how infuriated they were that this was done and i think it was the editor of kotaku posted how if, if this was him he would just write the review anyway and uh and then the the original tweet about how infuriated they were was then deleted but I wonder if that doesn't persist and there was some kind of, because I'm trying to make sense of it. I can't make excuses for launching a product that was not up to scratch. Like, did we launch a three out of 10 product? I didn't think so. Maybe we launched a launch six out date, of 10 Was product. that just dictated to you? You had to launch or what was, was it just circumstance? Uh, look, there is, there is back and forth. There is, um, we Just thought that we time. were, Sorry, I didn't hear I that. I mean, did you need more time or want more time? We absolutely could have done with more time. We absolutely could have done with more polish, more QA. Uh, I mean, it kind of sucks when reviewers and players are finding bugs that your QA team didn't. And that's what I said earlier. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of combinations. If you go with the full combinatorial calculation, there's something like, I don't know, two and a half million different combinations of all of the variables you can have by the end of the game uh, some of those are so small and it just like is a male or female character and you know a few little things that wouldn't have a major difference still when we reduced it down to like well how many combinations are there by the time you complete the game we were in the hundreds of thousands and when that happens it's you always can have some some combination of a quest that got missed or some thing that didn't work was you know something didn't load but moreover, there's a quality thing. There's expectations of, oh, this is this is the next Disco Elysium and Baldur's Gate three, and it's all these things. Um, so I think I think we suffered from high expectations as well, like not being met, and rightly so, shortcomings in quality. 
some poorly de developed characters, some confusing quests, some things that we thought made sense were like players have no clue where to go. So one of the first things we did after launch was add a lot more clarity to the quest objective. Do this with this person in this town, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to the more old school, you know, find this item somewhere in the in the wasteland. Uh, you know, if you played Fallout in the old games, you had no journal, you had no nothing. And I think we just didn't have enough quality of life stuff that contemporary gamers expect. Yeah, um, but, plus, uh, you know, I do want to reiterate, we launched, at launch, the game was not as good as it could have been. It's not definitely not as good as it is right now. Um, and those first impressions hurt us in, in a massive way. I still saw today, somebody posted, hey, I heard this game is seven hours long. Like, has it improved on the Steam forums? And I was responding to that just before this call. Because it's like, man, we'll... We we won't. I, I thought we'll never get out of Disco Elysium's Shadow, a game that had more funding, more than double the word count, just one of the most phenomenal like products of the last how many years, five years or whatever. But it seems we we're struggling to get out of the shadow of of the idea that we're a seven hour RPG, That's more so, than anything. I mean, what are they even talking about? Do they read that quick? And my guess is they're just skipping all the dialogues and stuff, right? I, I don't know. Uh, there is there is a six and a half hour video on YouTube where you can see that they, they seem to be reading some stuff, but you I think you need this exact build with this exact you know choice, having just enough money to do this exact route, and you can then get through the game. You skip most of the side content and you can reach the end game very, very quickly, which is like... That's not the oh, goal that's, here. I, I, you know? I can't even imagine playing games like that. <laughs> this is the difference between you know, somebody that just reviews games and somebody that plays the game, right? If I buy a game, I want to see every freaking thing in the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you look I, at... I go to that map and make sure I haven't missed any little totally. spot. Totally. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Slandered Gaming. He's a, a YouTuber, streamer. So he was the best part of launch week for us for sure because he was streaming it where it wasn't voiced he was doing the voices himself and he would clear the fog of war of every single map click on everything exhaust every dialogue option loot if and i was like this guy is our target audience like this yeah. guy is um playing it as we expect it to be played you know and yeah i just i think some people wanted or expected something different uh, I know for sure because we were never going for this. We were going to get people who came came into CRPGs via Disco Elysium that were expecting that from our game. I knew that they would be disappointed because that is not what we're going for. Like if you come from a Pillars, Wasteland, early Fallout, Baldur's Gate, um, if you come from that CRPG interest, that's who we're trying to hit. So I, I always knew that there would be a little bit of the kind of Disco Elysium stuff. I mean, I was even in, in conversations prior to launch kind of urging people in those conversations, please do not market us as the next Disco Elysium. Like that is not going to turn up well if you do that. Like I know that some reviewers have said that. And if we use those quotes too much, you're going to build an expectation that it's only going to be lead to dissatisfaction amongst reviewers and players um so yeah, to, to circle all the way back to say that the launch is, is disappointing is, is almost euphemistic it was it was bordering on catastrophic it was a it was a failure like we've lost team members and um the studio is in a very very challenging place but we've had to do a lot of work to turn the game into where it is now very, you know, very positive, which I'm extremely proud of the team for doing. Um, and also my co-founder Jethro and I, from day one, we were like, we are going to run this like a business. We're setting the studio up like a business. We are not just making a game here and going to launch the game and hope for the best. So we had a financial plan that involved the worst case scenario, which is what we faced, where what if Broken Roads is not profitable? How are we still going to go for a few months? It was like, that won't happen. Look at every forecast. Look at every review. Look at every pre preview, I should say. Look at all of the stuff, the interest, the wish lists, you know, over 200,000 wish lists at launch. Like, this game's going to be fine. 
Um, we still had a contingency for what if we don't sell a single copy? Um, and I think that's one of the differences between Drop Bear Bytes and maybe some other indie studios that we, over the last few years, have prepared for this, which it, that's the business side. You know, my co-founder is a economics and finance background, and we, we were, uh, I hate where we are, but we were able to go, right, we need to work super hard to patch this game and try and turn things around. Um, as opposed to, oh, shit, we didn't sell anything, fire everyone and terminate the studio next week. You've certainly been so. working your butts off with the patching. I mean, oh, even man. since I've, been, <laughs> I've started, started that long ago and I've already seen two patches, you know, come through. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's look, there, there's a couple of things that people misunderstand they think we started in january 2019 full team worked for five years fully funded by the australian government and worked for five years and this is what we launched like they they've got no clue like over the last five years there was 18 month period where we didn't have a developer we were underfunded we've shuffled publishers around it's been incredibly difficult um a consumer shouldn't have to worry about that a consumer is exchanging money for a product and that product should be of a particular level of quality and that's where we failed um but what we have been doing since launch is everything we can to try and go sorry sir i see that the lasagna i put on your table is is underserved let me take it undercooked let me take it back to the kitchen well the cooks are gonna uh, make you something special we'll put it back in the oven Please just wait uh, a month for the, the hot fix and we'll bring you, you know, a I satisfying thing. Yeah, I, yeah, I really hate to think that people are avoiding or avoiding this game because of that, you know, that publicity at the beginning, because they're really missing out on some pretty cool stuff. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Like, appreciate that. I, I do believe that word of mouth and like, if you launch a good product, it'll, it'll eventually turn around. You know, like it might be really slow, but once we have another, I don't know what the number is, 106 positive reviews, it'll turn the overall reviews from mixed to mostly positive and then another like few hundred and maybe we'll get into the very positive and then that'll become a snowball. Mm -hmm. um, I also really hope, like I was saying, some of those outlets that were like brutal, in their in their reviews um bastards. Might give it to <laughs> sorry those bastards i hate them yeah. look it's it's after, you know they went after me too with like my first first book dungeons and desktops and yeah i was so excited you know because it's my first book it was all about the history of computer role-playing games i worked yeah, yeah, no, butts off yeah. years of work into this thing uh they published a review of it a full page thing and uh pc gamer a magazine and the guy just tore it to freaking shreds you know and i'm like okay I'm, first i'm i can't cancel my subscription to this magazine fast enough <laughs> yeah but like uh, what the hell i mean i don't know what gets into people sometimes i i look i don't know um i mean that's still yeah, stupid. I, I just i just don't know it's it's I, I, I hope i never run into the guy <laughs> you know i'd hate to think of my reaction if i was ever introduced to him somehow yeah you you have to control your like you know there's a emotional there's a hurt there's a there's a, this stuff that you feel because somebody's tearing apart your art and your creativity and you have to go you know take it take an analytical approach take it take a philosophical reading of this oh, right there's I demand 17... satisfaction sir oh, totally. there's like seven satisfaction. 17 claims made six of these are completely invalid and eight of these are kind of stretches of the truth and three of these are completely like yep that's right we need to improve that and the six that are false like that's where you have to start um going okay well do i do some pr stuff do i make a blog post do i respond on a forum uh you know we, like there were stories oh well this entire game was funded by the australian government from day one what people don't know is i mean man the whole budget if i come to think of it i think we had probably less than four percent of the budget or i don't have the exact number right now uh whatever the number is it it was a small amount like enough to cover us through certain points of the project was provided by the Australian government. That's really cool. Rumors got out that the entire thing was funded by the 
Australian government. Like, where do you, you know, where does that come from? Then it's, oh, no, the game is only seven hours. After five years, they produced a seven-hour game. Like, what? Um, I mean, there's there's so much that, that you could talk about the um, the big outlets. But at the moment, it's it's YouTubers, it's streamers. Like, that's really where the... Um, those are the most valuable people to us because they are playing it and people can see them play it. And like I said, slandered uh, play of the origin stories up, you know, Mac he started a Machiavellian playthrough at launch week was one of the most uplifting things. And that answers your community members thing. Our spirits, seeing somebody love the game that much and do the voices and laugh at the, the moments that we wanted to be funny and, Oh, like shocked by the moments that we wanted to be shocking like that. That's super rewarding. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a commercial enterprise and we need to sell X copies to pay X salaries. And we've been unable to do that. So I can't say, oh, the reviews were unfair and the we were, we were um, downvoted. Like, no, if we'd released a quality product, I don't believe we would be in this situation. And I believe that we released a... You know, a game somewhere in the six, somewhere where the reviews Metacritic scores launched, we we launched something around there that now from our most recent review, we got a, a 70, 7 out of 10. And it was a really good thorough critical review. Um, we've also had multiple reviewers when they post their review on Twitter, they're like, maybe we weren't even playing the same game, but here's my review of Broken Roads and it's like an 8 out of 10. So I don't know, man, Metacritic downvotes on 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 steam what you're gonna do or you, you can lament it and you can get all you know cry in the shower eating a tub of ice cream or you can <laughs> you can go okay fuck it let's take the rocky quote it's not how hard you can hit it's it's you know t get hit and, and keep moving forward and that's all we can do that's all we can do matt yeah it's, it's, this is why i'm always saying that it's really important for people to whether you like a game or don't like a game, whatever, if you post a review, it really helps. You know, everybody, oh, like, everybody, tremendous. the developer, the other people thinking about buying the game. You know, yeah. if you're just really honest and like, here's my experience, here's what I liked, here's you know what yeah. I did. Even if it's negative, if it's constructive, it really we have we've improved the game through people's negative as opposed to Lame game, this sucks. Down yeah, okay, I can't do so much there to that. trash it. There's no value in that, you know. Yeah, but but like, when I'm... they say, oh, I can't, I can't recommend it because the companions are underdeveloped and this quest was confusing and this battle, then I'm like, cool, team, let's address those three points. Respond to that poster. Hey, in the June patch, this, this, this was addressed. I really hope you'll give it another try and maybe consider turning your negative review into positive. You know, that that's the approach we've had. Um, and I've I've got to also send a, a huge um thank you and shout out to Shanice who's the community manager at Tiny Build who's helped us so much engage with the people on on Steam and on the forums and on Twitter and on Discord and get that feedback and respond and been instrumental into turning this from mixed to mostly positive to very positive and that's one of the things that was called out in that review last week that 70 out of 100 review was I'm super proud of the team for doing this how well Drop Air Bytes have engaged with the reviewers, with the community, taken on the feedback and, and trying to make a more satisfying game. Maybe you could take all the really nasty reviewers and put them into the game somehow. Maybe that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I try to be people doing that. It was a productive. Pretty... Yeah. I don't know. There, 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 there the have been some of the, of the major outlet reviewers where it's like, that thing you said is so absurd or so ridiculous. Like maybe I'll work that into a patch in future. Like that was so crazy. Um, but at, at the same time, it's like, what what makes the game better? What makes the world better? And if it's not going to do it, like am I doing something for myself that is a quick little self-insert as a cheap little jab at some person who hurt my feelings? at launch does that really make the game better or like can i kind of rise above that and go screw it like this this youtuber who has twenty thousand followers of our core target audience that person let's let's make sure that he's happy because he's more important than 
you know, this reviewer who doesn't even seem to like this genre, like why the editors have given it to that person, giant question I mean, mark. like the disco elysium thing I, I think that's kind of the more i think about that i could see where that would really affect people's interpretation if they're going into this thinking it's going to be the same sort of game Yeah. because i think that's really really a, a different sort of experience than It's 99 it's it's percent wildly of different. It you is know probably a different choose your own adventure with dice rolls and an amazing skill system and a whole lot of things like it is a it is a brilliant game that is bordering on being a different genre. It's not you don't you don't class Pillars 2, Wasteland 3 and Disco Elysium in the same bucket. But um we we had our painterly art style defined like months before disco elysium even we we even knew it existed we announced our game and then like 10 days later disco elysium launched by the time people started hearing of broken roads there was the impression oh this is a disco elysium clone people saw disco elysium they enjoyed it, and they're trying to make a game like disco elysium it's like guys we we've been working on broken roads for like 10 months before we we even knew about that other game before that game launched Comparisons were unavoidable, and we've tried to. I think the closest I've ever said was like, "Oh, what they're doing with psychology, we're trying to do a bit like philosophy." But you know, beyond that, I've tried to go. Please do not expect the same experience. You, you're just not going to get it here. I'm trying. I cannot remember the game, but there was a uh, a reviewer. I think it was Computer Gaming Magazine. Is that the name of it? <laughs> anyway, there's a Maybe pretty famous uh, reviewer named Scorpia. Yeah, I remember. That was review. Computer Gaming World. Yeah, Computer Gaming World. And they, they wrote a really nasty review of a game, and the developer put a Scorpia monster. <laughs> Let's see. That. I always thought, you know, I think the reviewer probably thought that was, you know, more funny than, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, negative or hostile kind of thing totally. you know? that look that's a different time i think i think going <laughs> back to twitter again i oh. think if if there's a way to interpret something as hostile somebody will so oh. that they can post about it on social media and i'm just not interested no like, I'm, I'm with you I'm just there not interested. yeah well let's see if we cover i'm looking at my questions here so cover moral compass yeah, there was a question about were the Jagged Alliance games influential? So much less than people might think. Um, the style is similar. A lot of people mention them, um, but that just isn't really part of the DNA. Um, I think a, as, a, as a combat or tactics thing, Fallout tactics would be like, there's like a drip of that. But actually Jagged Alliance, uh, I, think, I think it's more superficial. Like it just looks a bit like it. Um, so the the very short answer is is absolutely like no. But having said that, a friend of mine posted a review on Jagged Lions 3 recently and on Steam. And I was like, wow, this sounds amazing. Like I really probably should pick up Jagged Lions 2 and 3 and then and put some time into them. I'll see if I can. Bernard, I, a lot of people over the years, oh, this looks like Jagged Alliance, or they've said it on, on Twitter, or they've said it on... I guess it does look TV. a little bit like it. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, we've got... There is a... There's a perspective. There's a abilities wheel. There's items at the bottom. Sorry. Um, icons at the bottom. Um, yeah, a lot of these games have, will look the same, though. Games you know? have that. Yeah, I mean that. Like you look at that screen you just had there, I could say that looks like Wasteland Three, the previous one. Um, that's a Wasteland. Oh, that could be a Wasteland Three screenshot. You know, these these games look very similar. But what is what has Jagged Alliance done? Well, it's really deep, detailed tactical combat. Like that's what they've gone into. Whereas for us, like combat is one part of the game. You know, what is it at its core? It's exploration, dialogue-driven, narrative-driven, RPG. Like, we want you to lose yourself. We want you to role-play. We want, okay, I am a hired gun in a post-apocalyptic Australia, and I'm going to be like somebody who's who's Machiavellian, bordering on utilitarian, and I, I generally try to go for the greater good, but but screw anyone else if if my interests are getting undermined. That's what I'm going to role play as. And I'm going to think about my responses. 
you know, that's kind of what we want, what we expect from the, the 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 player going into it, that that's the kind of experience that they want. If they want really deep tactical combat, I'm sure they're going to be disappointed. The, the combat is still not where I'd like it to be in Broken Roads. Um, but I again... My, I got my butt kicked a lot. <laughs> yeah, the co combat's not... Uh, Combat's not the hero of this game, you know. It should be the the characters and the the adventure and the freedom and the options and so forth, you know. That that are and by I mean dialogue options, um, and replayability. I mean, which we can get to in a second as well. Um, yeah, we had a couple of questions about that. Hmm. Yeah, was it re longer game or replayable one? Why does re replayability matter in rpgs sure <laughs> a big a big question an, an essay length <laughs> answer um well there's there's two things you've got to have an amazing one-off experience like if you're going to play a game and you have 500 items in your steam backlog or whatever like are you really going to play a game more than once I, I don't remember the exact number but i think it was 86 percent of players who played Mass Effect 2 only played it once. And that has so many different options. There's so many ways to reach those endings and so on. Um, so it's like, no matter how much we might design for replayability, because we absolutely did, four origin stories, multiple ways through the game, many different endings, the four moral quadrants, the the, the different um, towns and ways to get into Kalgoorlie. We really wanted it to be replayable. But if you lean too much into the replayability, you might not be putting enough of a magnifying glass on, well, if, you know, four-fifths of players are never going to pick it up a second time if they finish it, we better make sure that that one experience for them is just as satisfying. Um, but those two go hand in hand in, in an interesting way because if you have enough role-playing options, if you've got enough, all right, this is a key moment. I want to have two origin story unique dialogue options. I need a quest that is unique to only Machiavellian characters, uh, and I need three skill checks here to get through this, that single experience player might not even notice and is like, oh, that's cool. I got to have this option. And they get more role playing. It's like, I, I am this selfish character in this world doing this thing, and I'm going to role play as such. If we've designed around replayability, we've covered that. You know, that that the one kind of encompasses the other. Um then if you are replaying and you've built, made a completely different build, I'm now a humanist, barter crew, you know, just just happy-go-lucky, want the best out of this world and going to be nice to everyone and ramping up intelligence and charisma. Mm. Um, wow, this game feels so different. There's totally different options. Gee, like the 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 trader path through Kuda is wildly different to the philosophical path through um, Lake Deborah you get something out of it of, of like, because I generally play RPGs more than once for exactly this. And I leave some content out for exactly this reason, because, Hey, you're going to get so much more out of it. Um, you, you kind of got to satisfy both. And I think if you do a really good job on the replayability, you, you cover that solids one-off experience as well. I'm doing a lot of my replayability while I'm playing. <laughs> there, was a, there was that moment where you're trying to free your your guy, your mechanic, or tinker, or whatever. Yeah, Cole. Yeah, uh, Cole. And I, it was really interesting. The first time I just got my butt completely kicked. I'm like, okay, I, I got to figure some some other strategy to this. So reload once, <laughs> uh, and then it was like, okay, now I can talk to some people in town and get them to uh, distract the lady you know so i tried that but then there was like several options within that you yeah. know and i'm like I, I must have replayed that scene about five or six times because <laughs> i wanted to see like well am i happy with this i did get cold back but i don't really like the way that went down <laughs> yes yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so it's not like we, that you know i do a lot try of to do that during it just because i want to see all the different possibilities did you have a high tinker skill and any kind of lubricant any oil, any turpentine, because that's another option if you didn't do that. No, I don't even know if I'm aware of that. Yeah, I've got all this yeah. stuff. So so that that's another thing. Like there's ways to can improve avoid... weapons. I mean, I've been doing that with my scraps yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Well, there, there's... While I got you on. So the 
<laughs> so you're picking up all these items all over the place, right? Some of them say junk. Yes. So I assume that's just vendor trash. Absolutely. Right? right? But Absolutely. if it says general. So general is you might be able to use it for an upgrade. You might be able to use it for a side quest, but not having it will never block you from progressing the game. Whereas we've got quest items, which you can never sell. So we tag them as quest. You can never sell. You can never give them away except to the quest person who, who wants them. And that, that distinction was to um, basically prevent people from soft locking their progress by having quest items. Mm -hmm. Now, we also had to pull a bunch of content or save a bunch of content. So there were general items that got demoted to junk that were in the game. Uh, we've just done a big pass in the recent patch of vendors to minimize how much junk um, that they're selling because as a new player, you see all these items and it's like, okay, what can I craft from this? Why is this important? And you might purchase a few of them, but you're like, oh shit, I've just bought vendor trash. Uh, that's no good. Whereas general, it's like, uh, you can... Because I'm, I'm, I'm collecting books for the philosophy uh, folks. And some of the books say junk. Yeah. Uh, so I so, assume it's so, not a book that they want, right? That must be like a just a regular book lying around. So <laughs> there are there are different not a books. Philosophical. No, exactly. So there's there's some books that are like on economics. You know, there's some books. I think there's a, a science book by it might be by Tesla. There's some other economics books in it's there. Like John Maynard Keynes book. And yep, I yep, saw that. Yep. And I'm like, well, that's kind of philosophical. I mean, oh, it, it, it is. Read that. <laughs> I don't know. It's so there's there's <laughs> multiple libraries in the game. Uh, one of them is part of a critical path, and that's the philosophy books, and that's you know how you got to get through there's some side quest content with other books and there's some books that are just kind of junk um here you have to experiment or we have to experiment with is the game more fun at the end of the day if we have a range of books that are from worthless to side questy to crit path or are we just confusing players and the game's less fun so then it's weird because I had somebody else come to me and say, what happened? Did some plane fly over and just drop a whole bunch of philosophical texts in the wasteland and like every vendor is selling something? Um, what is more fun for the player? And it's I think we're still finding that balance where, oh, gee, it might be realistic that there are books that no one's interested in, but it's confusing for the player and they don't know what to purchase and what to hang on to and what they can sell. Um, so we are certainly going to patch in more use for some of those other books like Keynes and Tesla and so on. Um, but for now, we've like, hey, guys, if it's marked as junk, there is no use for it in the game. If it's marked as general, you might be able to use it for an upgrade. It might be in some non-essential side quest. Uh, and if it's marked as quest, pretty obvious, you know. That's a good game design, game development thing that we're talking about here. Because it is, you know, if, I, if I'm playing the game for the first time and I, maybe I don't know anything about that library quest coming up and I just find a book and it says quest item. Yeah. See, I know as a player, well, I should probably buy that because it's going to come <laughs> at some point. But I mean, that's a very gamey thing. It's, it's totally. not kind of immersion. Totally. And and that that has been a thing the whole time. Oh, that's very gamey. That breaks immersion. But it's like, yeah, but this is also a game. It is a game. And you go... <laughs> you go too far in the other direction and you're just like you're confusing people you know um so that be that's been annoyed if you wouldn't let me buy the book now and then later i find a quest and i'm like oh i should have bought i wish i had known that i needed the book <laughs> well <laughs> the trade-off is always where trade where we do that like again we don't block the player out and there's one where you can buy the book from a character that can get killed in the origin stories and if he is killed in the origin stories, the same book is in a trash can very close to him. So we just kind of did some logic that if the player didn't buy it, by the time the town was destroyed, you can go and get, you can always find it. Um, we, you know, Other than that, most of the books are available from vendors you can find later in the game or bookshelves you know, that you can only find later in the game. That's cool. um so yeah we, we did great. like we you can't get you, it's bad bad game design or bad game qa is having the player blocked
because you've prevented them from being able to get something essential. That's that's 1980s like gold that's rush Sierra. You know, you didn't get the oranges, and so now you've got um, scurvy or whatever because you didn't find an item three hours ago. That that type of quest design is is well and truly a thing of the past. Yeah, I've been trying to trap these possums. Oh, okay. So I can help you with so that. I, I was confused with this one because I, I, I think I messed it up because I was shooting the possums. And yeah. That's no, that's, to do, we right? need a tutorial. We need a better tutorial. That's, it's the. Is there a trap somewhere is, to purchase? Excuse me? I need to build a trap or what's the. You just need to walk adjacent to them and the target becomes a hand instead of shooting and you crouch down and you pick them up. And that should be tutorialized. It should be communicated. Like that's that's our bad. And it's weird because some players did exactly that, and other players, oh, I shot one and I picked up the other two, and now I feel like I failed the quest. And others just like blast them all and take them back and get a different reward. Um, also, so we were just talking this week. You just still get a reward if you come back with the dead possums. <laughs> oh, totally. You you we the the reward scale like the guy who wants them alive. But, you know, there is still a reward because um, you do still complete the quest. Okay. But no, we, yeah, we've spoken about there. adding... It's just, zero. it's just that zero of three, zero of three, even though I killed all three, maybe there could be like a little thing. It's like, well, you killed three out of three. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, that, that's a good point. For lesser reward, dummy. <laughs> yeah, no, what, what we were talking about this week, because that did still come up where somebody shot one and captured two, is like, no, we need to have the tutorial pop up that says, that just tells them, you can shoot them, but if you want to take them alive, walk up to them, you'll be able to pick them up, no problem. Um, you know, that, that's one of the sort of launch teething problems that we, we clearly still have to, because it's not, it's, it's not apparent to players. And I mean, even having this conversation with you now, it's clearly not apparent that if you walk up to the possum, it will you will suddenly have an interaction icon and you'll be able to crouch down and pick them up. Um, so I think that's a simple tutorial that we, we need to pop up with that exact quest. You know, I was excited about that quest. <laughs> like you were catching fossils. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I think there's a lot. Uh, I was thinking about Australia and some of that. I, I know it mostly from movies, but you know, I, I wonder how similar it is to like where I grew up in Louisiana, like Florida. <laughs> Because you know, there's a lot of the same kinds of folks, <laughs> different slang, <laughs> sure, <laughs> but sure. the attitudes, you know, are very familiar. To me. Uh, that's that's cool. This this is like, um, you know, this portion of Western Australia is called the wheat belt. It's farming and mining country. Um, it is not reflective of, you know, Melbourne, Sydney, not even Perth, which is the the you know the largest city in Western Australia. That's just like an hour sounds west of like where you start the game. Midwest. Sorry, like the mid, what, sounds like more like our Midwest. Maybe I'm I'm not too familiar with with the Midwest, but this oh, is definitely God. like rural rural Australia, rural Western Australia. Like I say, mon mining and farming country, um, and we, we you know we took a couple trips over there. We've taken literally thousands of photos. We've been to the locations in the game. Uh, we've met the people who are actually there, been driven around by um, some locals and shown certain spots, introduced to the area by um, some of the Aboriginal people who, who live close to Meriden, um, taken a ton of photos and recorded the sounds of like Wave Rock. You know, so, so if you go to Wave Rock and you listen to, have you, I don't know if you've l found that location yet, on the very south of the map, you just go kind of straight yeah, south from Meriden. The, the village, right? And the farmer. Uh, like that, that's where you're trading with him to get your. You have to trade some be, the items to, to go. Uh, I, I don't recall right now. Wave, Wave Rock is a pretty well known Western Australia landmark. It's a, you know, it's a rock formation that does look like a wave. So we went there, we took. Uh, a whole bunch of shots from different angles so that it could be modeled in the game. And our audio lead recorded, um, you know, the sound of the wind and the birds and the whatever. And when you, there we go, that that location. So when you are walking around that part of the game, 
you oh, are sorry. hearing the sound. H have you seen that in game yet? I'm not, I'm, 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 we're thinking about the same place. I... So you arrive and then they it's a trader you may have met in Brookton earlier. He meets you at the entrance and they've got a whole bunch of kids there and they're raising chickens and they've got a little farm, little uh, garden area. There's a guy called Tin Man who's one of the tinkerers who can upgrade your weapons and so on. Um I wish I, I should just boot up the game so I could see Rolla. <laughs> yeah, if you showed up the yeah, if you showed me your this. world map, then I'd uh I'd be able to uh um your world map in game, I mean I'd be able to show you sort of where it is. But that's just one of the places where the team did a really good job of bringing a bringing a real world location to life, uh, matching the the patterns on on the rock formation, the the sound, the wind going through those exact trees that you know chickens and whatever that you can hear in that moment were recorded at that place in the real world equivalent. Give me one uh, second. So that was one of the fun things. Give me one was second. Make... Uh, but I might I might have to pause for a second. Let's see if I can get sure. it. Sure. It'll be full screen, so I'll have to like shrink it. Yeah, no worries. Um, but that definitely was a fun part of making this game was going to those places because you can google street view and google satellites and whatever but nothing matches being there and spotting something that you didn't see online and, and and adding that into the game okay i'm gonna i'll turn the sound effects on because i guess i need to hear it okay can i make the video window <laughs> Uh, I got this big widescreen thing here, so there we go. Okay, let's see if I can share this. Is that sharing? There you go. Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's a quote from Spinoza. Yep. Peace is not mere absence of war. <laughs> there's virtue that springs from character. Right, so you're inside Kuda. If you want to leave by the just to the left, you can't access the world map. You have to go to the left. And there's a oh not not that door. There's one sorry down and to the left, and further further to the left. And also all those designs on the ground were were done by um Aboriginal artists from the area as well. So that's like you need oh, wow. um, for the game, um, which is yeah we we we've had a. There's a lot of really small touches that I think if people like slow down and pay attention to this <laughs> and the cat's meow again. Well, this is fun. Uh, the government was interested in this, I'm sure. This is like promote uh, like education about real Australian stuff. Well, we there's a character there that tells like dream time stories and stuff that was all done in with you know consultation with Noongar elders and so on and written by uh Noongar writers like we didn't produce most of that content ourselves it was done in conjunction with us but the whole of Kuda um and and all of the aboriginal characters around it are written by people um you know from that language group from that area uh there's no way that we could try and touch that's that. that's awesome so, yeah. <laughs> no thanks we it, it, it's awesome while at the same time if you didn't do it could you just imagine the the response and reaction you know some some guy who's not even been in oh, australia yeah. seven uh, years cultural just appropriation. that's it just just took all of this cultural like stuff that's super um it's so foreign to me not even being from this country and even here like where i live in in torquay which is south of melbourne i can't have people from this area um consulting on Noongar country, which is, you know, where you are right now in the game, we had to find people from that region to speak to elders from that region to be able to approve the characters, the portraits, the looks, the quests, like everything here was done in in, in conjunction. Well, you say that you were required to? I mean, was this part of the grants, I suppose? Or... Um... Well, one you? of the grants, one of the grants was specifically to help out with this content. I mean, then there was a requirement because it was part of the contract that we did was like, hey, we would like to do this content. We need to bring these people on board. We've got to send some of our team over to Western Australia. And, and we did get a grant specifically around this content. We got unrelated grants that, you know, it wasn't a requirement. 
but it would have been far more like, well, there's no law that says you have to do this, but my God, are you making a stupid mistake if you don't, yeah. you know, like if you, if you don't even attempt to do this properly, um, which is a whole other story. Like when I started trying to find people to help out with the Aboriginal content, I got the full range of responses from, man, that's so awesome. You're trying to do it, write whatever you want and then bring it to us and we'll like tell you what you can and can't keep. But thank you so much for like normalizing us through inclusion to the complete opposite, which was like, don't even try. You won't get it right. You, you're going to run into a lot of problems. So rather just like, don't don't try and include any Aboriginal content. So I said, well, it's not going to be authentically Australian if I don't. And the person said, yep, like that's exactly right. But we don't think yeah. that you can pull this off. And, and everything in between, you know. So we've done a good faith, best effort attempt to include the people of this, of this um, country where the game is set. I'm happy, like extremely proud, extremely happy with the outcome. I know that some people are not, um, but I've heard enough good things from people like, you know, like I said, that drove me around that part of the game and spoke to me and, and took me to places and told me about the cultural significance and so on. And they've been super positive. So go just to the, the south uh, west of where you are, bottom of the map down from Westonia, go a little bit further west. Wait. Even further, sorry, southwest. Go straight south of Westonia. Just yeah, walk to the bottom of the map. Yeah, like even further down. There we go. Kind of, kind of where the other cursor is. Just head in that direction and go to the bottom of the map, and you'll get to Wave Rock. Now, now further south. I think now there we go. Oh, Wave Rock. Yeah, let's see this. <laughs> So that's the other thing is this is Fallout. This is a Fallout One map. We want you to walk around. We want you to clear fog of war, and we want you to go like, oh, there's so much cool little side content to explore here. You know, if you I'm beeline sure. the crit path, you're going to miss out on all this kind of stuff. Remember that Monty Python skit with all the was it Australia? <laughs> yep, that ap totally, completely. That was that was pretty intentional to to get more Bruces in the game than <laughs> than it might be believable. You know. Let's see, I'll be able to see the rock. We're going to have yeah. to go through some things up. I don't want to skip through this because I might need to read That's it. That's cool. I mean, you can always reload. The autosave will reload you to before this dialogue. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, we just get through. Then once, you, once you've gone through this, you should just wait until morning the, at the bottom right and then uh, walk to the north of the map. Oh, there we go. Whoa. <laughs> I keep habitually hitting that fast mode. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, I, I played through a lot of pillars. Like I liked that modern quality of life feature. That's, you know, that was something that we added after launch because a lot of people requested it. Uh, the sound. So that's, that's a little higher. <laughs> Is there a sound? Uh, Yeah. You're going to have to turn the master volume. Your master volume is too low. There we go. Do you have ambience up? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't see. I think you did. Yeah, you do. Okay, cool. Um, open the open the mini map, or just push M. Wait, I hear it. I don't know if this is going to play through the Zoom. No, I I can't hear it coming through here. Uh, but if you, if you open the mini map, you can actually walk on top and everything. There's like real steps that we we've, we've mimicked and everything. Um, but yeah, that that's a place to explore that is like totally taken from. So you walk further to the right. There we go. So those steps also like they're all there in in the real world. Um, there is a barrier that's on the top that is there in the real world as well. Um, and this is just a place to explore that's like it can be become of more significance later, but. This is one that we just wanted to put in um, in the game. Like it's it's too iconic and too close to to W. It's also a um, one where the Aboriginal consult consultation said no. This is this is too sacred to have it the way you 
uh, originally designed. So if you just load up the mini map quickly, please. So you see, you see the where the settlement is. Well, it's it's kind of covered in the dark fog of war. There, that was a lot closer to the rock originally. We had some like top hall and tents that they were sort of using the rock as cover, as like to form a home underneath that and constructing much more part of the landscape. And the person we were working with was said like, no, the, the significance is a little like, that's a little too much for us. There's already a campsite and so forth, a little distance away. Like, please move your settlement a little further away from the rock itself. And it's like, cool. That's like a couple of weeks work for us to make it not, you know, to make it not uh, disrespectful of, of, of the people from the area that we're trying to, you know, do right by. That makes it a little more authentic too, I guess. Mm. And now I really kind of want to explore this, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that guy right there, that's Tin Man. He's one of your uh can make some unique like upgrades and and so forth. Um he's 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 there, Tinkerer, you know. So he does a better job than Cole. Uh different. Um although him and if you've gone to Lockie and Lake Deborah, they have um, they've all basically got the same upgrades. But it's possible to to come here before you've rescued Cole, before you've gone to Lake Deborah, that kind of thing. Yeah, this is one that can I complain? <laughs> so I got so, yeah, I got, please. I got screwed on this because I upgraded a weapon and before it, you had the the stats to allow you to use it. Uh, this, what what happened was this. So I didn't realize it took the item out of your inventory. Ah, uh, okay. So I got into a battle like right after I upgraded. And right. So that's, I think that's pretty, uh, you know, I would say easy to solve, but I am going to make a note about that one. Um, it's about the only thing I saw. <laughs> why did you bring me on to, to just complain about my game, Matt? Jeez. I don't want to say this. I actually okay, want to. Let me it. let me uh make a note. And I see you've got the desert peas. Do you want to know where the brewery is while we're at it? No, I've already shut it down. I'll go back no, later. No worries. No worries but I saw you had I saw you had the ingredient for making the unique craft beer that the guys after. So um, I, mean, I can I actually had... brew beer in this. I can make my own craft beer. You don't make it, but you take it to the brewer who does. Ah. <laughs> this is a game made for me, I tell you. Yeah, the only thing it needs is some... Do you, well, man, you might have some rats in there somewhere. Rat, well, what are you getting fight yeah, with? we've got little lizards that scurry. It definitely needs... We've got drop bears. Did you fight the drop bears in Lake Deborah? Um, I, I don't know about... Oh yeah, yeah, I fought them. Yeah, I fought some cool. bears. I fought some uh, some kangaroos. A lot of uh, cool, really cool. nasty. Looking. No, we we need a a shitty little basement filled with rats. Like we just with like a hundred rats that have like one hit point, and you just got to slaughter them all. Australia has yeah. a problem with rabbits, like a bunch of rabbits everywhere, or tarantulas. Yeah, yeah, Australia does. You know, there's a whole thing about the rabbit proof fence, which itself is a as a um, fraught history. Um, yeah, we've we've included like they're not really there as animals so much as vfx that exists in the in the scene snakes little lizards you know things that will scurry away as you approach them uh we do have giant spiders um wombats kangaroos I mean, there's a whole bunch of like wildlife that ranges from koala bears that you can actually pet if you find them and you can reach them you can actually like pet them like the other animals through to aggressive kangaroos and 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 combat wombats and and so forth. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to fight the kangaroos. That could... <laughs> I always thought of thought of a kangaroo as being this fun animal, but I guess it they out. they're they're a wild animal, like any wild animal in the world. And over here, they can come and eat out of your hand, or they can you know if you if you're threatening to them or if you're in the wrong place like you respect every wild animal it's just just the way it is so there's there's videos of of them getting super aggressive they you know they can kind of kick really strongly with their tail um there's a aboriginal cultural center just up the road that had some emus and 
wallabies and kangaroos and they had a uh, a juvenile that was getting a bit more like he was he was kind of growing up and testing his uh where does he fit in the hierarchy and he started like not badly but he was starting to like kick the guests and he came up to me and he started to like be a little bit aggressive and the guy i was with just kind of reminded him who's boss um so no they're, they're a wild animal as as cute and friendly as they can be yeah i've never met one <laughs> um, you would weigh, weigh you up. <laughs> well that i've known a lot of ostriches yeah okay so and, so emus are obviously they look like cousins i wouldn't know genetically how close they are but we've got emus in the game for sure uh, yeah. ostriches is more like my original home they're more of a south african creature than my neighbor was a ostrich farmer he got mm. in he got into thinking it was like this going to be this big thing over here ostrich burgers <laughs> wow okay well, look it's 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 good meat yeah, ostrich but... biltong and they make really good steaks and so on um, I... in our game you don't have an ostrich farm but there is an emu farm that that one of the guys can get involved in uh, right next to hunters and collectors in meriden there is an emu farm in in our game as well so we try to put as much little bits and pieces as we can that well we need to talk before we i know we got to wrap up here but I don't know if we really talked enough about the Australian accents and the uh, all of the uh, slang, which to awesome. me is fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I like awesome. the how you, you even let people like scroll over the slang and see what it means, which is a really nice touch. Yeah, we that that's like our law, you know, our, our equivalent of when you're playing, I don't know, pillars and they mention some ancient god and you've got to read like, who is this guy? What is this continent or what is whatever? We're like, Let's have that feature, but for Aussie slang, and let's let's not hold back at all uh, on the amount of like slang terms and terminology. Uh, so that that was that was really fun as well, and a lot of people have have uh, commented on that feature. That's just like it's it's authentic to have the slang, but having that feature of being able to mouse over or whatever or have it defined, like people love it. You know that that's definitely a something in the win column for us. That's yeah, just super cool. You know, I noticed a lot of games will try to come up with their own slang or something, but it's just never quite as fun if it's fictional than like you know people are actually using this slang. Yeah. So if I remember exactly. there, you know, I'd be like think I'm fair and this. <laughs> oh, so many slang words for like food. Or... Yeah, yeah, Tucker. Just and... have like the standard Kirk cussing and stuff when you could throw in some some fun slang. Totally. And um, look, also it's uh it has some character. I've never met anybody like Crocodile Dundee. You know, I've never met Mick Dundee in the real world. And we had some people say, oh, we we thought we would see a little bit more of that. Um, but yeah. we try to keep it like you can still have a lot of fun with just authentic Australian personalities, you know. And we do cover quite a range because you you'll get like one of the politicians, say, in Meriden that is like, upper class and proper and and whatever and you'll find that person in australia then you'll find the rough farmer uses every bit of slang you could hardly understand them if you just landed in the country and never spoken we, we try to cover for those people as well um I, I don't know maybe in the future patch we'll lean in a little bit harder and have like stereotype man who has just like every single thing of what people believe Australians are like based upon like popular media or memes or stereotypes, but uh, um, nice. yeah, we've we've tried to keep it uh realistic, you know, and you still have a lot of fun with with uh, with that. I was thinking about that first Crocodile Dundee movie with some of the little taverns and things because there's one that looks looks exactly to me like the tavern and Crocodile Dundee where he goes in and has the fight and everything. Totally. But you know, maybe they just maybe there's just that's just the standard look. <laughs> look, the the locations in our game are real. Like that's that's a thing. And it's but it's like if Crocodile Dundee were to take, you know, a mishmash of every single stereotype, and that's like what Paul Hogan did for that character. But the bars and the little like out outback um pubs and whatever, those are completely how you will find them. 
you know, you have in to the more real world. This is more Mad Max, I think, than Crocodile Dundee for sure. <laughs> well, Absolutely. Crocodile Dundee, they, they're really trying to play up the Australians. You know, look how wacky this guy is and yeah. how he's a fish out of water, you know. Whereas, you know, Mad Max, yes, is Australian, but they're not like making it for a, a American audience, right? And really, kind of just, like, look how. Yeah zany this is which i think is i like both of them <laughs> cool. but we, we try to have look fallout as well had some really good humor and it's it's an absolute part of australian culture is give each other shit rip each other off you know there's a lot of um banter there's a lot of fun with uh, uh how people can speak to each other as well um while while being really serious so you've got this like serious serious stuff going on and then people like ribbing it ribbing each other along the way as well um fallout the early fallouts did that really really well and that's something where we've gone to where it's like hey let's have let's have some people chirping up let's have some humorous things that aren't like taking itself too seriously while the world itself is like defined by struggle and shortage and and suffering and that kind of thing and this difficult post-apocalyptic world people will always adapt and always try to make the best of it and always form friendships and relationships and so on and some of those will will give each other shit and laugh about old times and whatever in amongst the the shortage and the struggle and the scarcity yeah that's what i've always heard from people that lived in like so the worst of the soviet union and things of that sort and they're like well one thing i do miss is the, the humor <laughs> like the jokes are hilarious <laughs> You know, if like you everybody don't was a comedian and i was like this is weird like so even though you're in this horrible situation people are laughing and joking is oh yeah you know you if you don't to, do that if you don't oh. find the humor in it man like if you if you can't find something to laugh at and something to uh bring you that little bit of joy gee you know like it's a it's a defense mechanism it's a it's a part of human nature to um to laugh in struggle, to laugh in a, adversity and whatever, because hey, it makes you feel that little bit better. Like even just that brief moment of laughing and forgetting your troubles, you know. I think I have time for one more question. I don't. <laughs> Is this from Tired Gaming Dad? Has the <laughs> game done well? Yeah, Tired Gaming Dad. Uh, has the game done well enough for the team to keep working on patching or DLC for the next? Wait, let me get this question straight. Keep working on patching or DLC for the next game? Or does he mean DLC for this game? So maybe I'll just put it in my own words. Oh, look, I mean, I, I think I, I get it. Obviously continue it on patching, but are you thinking about some DLC at some point or a sequel? A absolutely. Like sequel, we're not thinking about just yet. Whether it happens, unsure. Um, we are, we've had to pull certain content that we want to patch back in that wouldn't necessarily be dlc um we've started work on dlc and expansions like even before launch just as part of the the deal with the the publisher um we no one expected the game to do as badly as it did so we kind of thought oh it'll it'll be okay it'll transition we'll patch we'll slowly move on to additional content we'll probably release some free content expansions of the things that we were like this isn't good enough. It's not polished enough, but it's also not DLC. Let's hold it back till we can integrate it, get it localized, and then just release it as a free content update. Like that's still underway. Official expansions, patches, you know, other stories within the world. All of that is like on ice indefinitely because who's going to pay for the QA? Who's going to pay for the localization? Uh, no, the game didn't do well enough at all. The game didn't even do remotely close to well enough to support the team to keep going through to that point. Uh, we're hoping that this, that the last two months of effort turns the reviews around snowballs that we, you know, that kind of thing where maybe six months from now, nine months from now, two years from now, I don't know when it is going to be that the game is actually profitable enough that we can keep building on additional content um, but like I said earlier, you know, Jethro set this up in such a way that we, we, we weren't at a, you know, profit or studio closure at launch situation. So there's more to come. We've only just brought on, uh, Olga and George, you know, what a month ago, a little over a month ago to start helping out with improving, like, here's the feedback or play it yourself or like, um, here's what 
the critics and the players were saying are the worst things. Olga George, go through it. What do you think? What should we change? Are you going to write some content? Whatever. All of that's still coming. Whether it's August, September, October, right now, I'm not entirely sure, but there is much more content. Um, one of the biggest regrets and a thing that I will never do again is agreeing to launch localized in so many languages. It has its advantages for sales and so forth. Obviously, the game's successful, but it caused such a limitation on our word count and such restraints on ter in terms of you need this content done six months before launch so that we can have, you know, 350, 400 plus thousand words localized by launch that it's like, okay, well, that quest doesn't feel so good right now, but I can't go back and change it because it has already been localized into six languages. Like we'll never do that again. That was a, a publisher thing. And, um, you know, hey, we got the game across the finish line. Now we might do community localization. We might see if there's any other funding we can get together to to translate other things. But we do have an English updates beta branch on Steam. It's not the easiest. Like it's pretty simple. If you click the button, you've got the instructions. We can only work on the game in English. Let's say we add another 100,000 words to Broken Roads in the coming months. That'll only be in English. It'll be English only on GOG. You'll have to be on the English Updates branch in Steam, which is a couple of clicks. It's called English Updates. The password is English Updates. And if we can then get community localizers or funding or whatever, we'll translate it into the other languages. Um, but really what I think should have happened, if I could change one thing, I'd go back, remove any commitment to launch in multiple languages, have six, 700,000 words to this game polished up until launch day, and then worry about translating uh, after launch. So very long way to answer um, old gaming dad or tired gaming dads question that we're still going. Uh, we are going to be going for quite a few more months on improving the content, improving quest design, taking on feedback. Um, and really like we put too much into this to abandon it. So yeah, DLC completely on ice, additional content, additional patches, additional polish, hundred percent coming. Uh, I really wish there would be some DLC, you know, especially with George on the team. Cause he's like, he's done the best DLC of all time. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, we, we have some stuff in the wings, you know. I mean, imagine Colin, Olga, and George working on something together, you know. Um, step one, get the base game to be what it deserves to be. And then, for sure, you know, we'll, we'll add more content. We'll add some DLC and expansions. Maybe a V8. <laughs> you know, I was thinking there should be some vehicles. I mean, I guess there's vehicles in there, but. Yeah, and that's just more more scope creep and more like there there are, but they didn't play as big a role. You know, they like I said earlier, the original design was it's a road trip, and you know you actually stop and get out of these things. Caravan. Sorry, it was you know the caravan with the yeah yeah exactly. So you're moving the convoy along, uh, fuel and and we threw out all of the survival elements, all of the resources. You need food, you need water, you need petrol. And you can see the essences of those are still in the game. But we just found that, you know, I'm on a quest to go get medicine to heal somebody. Um, and now I'm kind of distracted by having to find food and water for myself. And this narrative driven game is now feeling like a like a survival game as well, when it's, I, I really just want to be having my conversations and explore the moral compass. So we're like, nah, this is, this is kind of just impacting things in a, in a, it's more negative than positive. Net, it's a net negative. Let's just pull the survival elements. Um, I noticed that with the ammunition too, right? You just, you have a, you could have made it so you had to find bullets like in the, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, we, we decided that that was kind of early that we wanted to go more um, XCOM like where setting up your character before the fight is what matters. And you got burnt by that by upgrading your weapon and it wasn't equipped when you got in your next fight. So yeah, that's something we need to improve. But we, we made the decision that like, no, nah, let's not micromanage bullets because that adds yet another thing that we have to balance and QA and test and whatever with our very, very small team in this already massively ambitious game. Uh, so by minimizing 
every any item or economy or damage or uh, inventory management or survival element minimize those there's less to balance and we can pour our energy into the story and the the characters and that kind of thing more than anything else i think you got your priorities in the right place <laughs> well thanks yeah no well, thanks for doing this no of course i'm stoked uh, to be I'm on. sorry that the you know, that initial blast was negative but hopefully that will You know, get bit yeah, I, I hope it changes over time. Like, I, I just want people to see this game is not done yet. We have, uh, I, I never wanted to launch an early access. Like, I wanted to launch a finished product, and I think we have a de facto early access here, even though it's sold hmm. as a full release and everything like that. I think people might have been way more forgiving if we'd said it was early access. Um, but yeah for all intents and purposes that's what people have found themselves with the product that is live where the devs are responding to players and patching things and improving things and adding things and it's 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 uh <laughs> it's not on the surface early access but man under the hood it's it's certainly uh playing out that way yeah i hope it turns around obviously like for the studio for the for the team, for for what this game could be, for what people's expectations are, um, we're getting there, man. Like if, if we were still at mixed reviews after two months of effort, I would be like, hey, we've done something really wrong here. But things are going in the right direction. You know, appreciate your interest in it, that we've got something that George and Olga were prepared to, you know, come on board with. Um, you know, Colin's still on, on, on the team and... Um, I believe we'll turn it around, even if it takes quite a few more months. You know, I've been trying to transition to something funny, but <laughs> just it has a bit of point to do it. You know, maybe I'll just show you and edit this part out uh, of the video. But I just I had oh, some good, fun. Man. I was having some fun with a Chat GPT. Oh, cool, cool. I was, I was uh, telling it about John Denver and the song "Country Roads." Make it broken. <laughs> so I told it to make me a song based on John Denver's Country Road song, but make it about your game. And I plugged in some uh, some of the details. Oh, awesome. I could just show you what it came up with. I was yeah, cool, man. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, See, that's good. We have so to keep that. I'm just going to grab a, a screen grab of that because I'm going to send it to Tim. Oh, I can. Really... It's not bad though. I mean, it's got weird. No, it's it's not bad at all. Wow. What is the work in some of the slang? Let's see. Machiavellian G. It really did get the details, eh? Hard yakka. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. But the win now. And hey, that, that look, that is some damn impressive. Um... <clears throat> impressive ai tech yeah this thing just copy, copy and paste this in the email or, or it lets you send a link i think to that but that's pretty cool add the words yak and machiavellian good job yeah i was like the first one was just okay so i, I kept giving a little details about the game and mm -hmm. it was getting better and better and i was like you know if we could just if maybe a few more keywords, <laughs> a few more improvements, I might actually I've done, <laughs> done a good one. Then may, may have to record a cover and, and chuck it in. Um, yeah, Chat Chat GPT had some very interesting hallucinations about broken roads around launch and when the lead up to launch. Um, that text will got a, a way to go, but for the for what you just done there, it's it's pretty damn impressive, you know. Yeah, I'm never sure, but I just like playing around with it. But I know there's a lot of game developers that are like, you know, might as well be talking about the Antichrist. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it it reminds me of it's like a luddite knee jerk response, and I think that there is some very valid stuff about like, well, let's not eliminate humans, and you won't. But then there's also yeah, as in eliminate humans from the game development process. But you can also save a lot of time, and you can take like get the machine to do certain uh heavy lifting and so on where it's like um well exactly like what you've done there i mean the, the examples are really amazing what they're doing with images and video as well um and if you've got some guy in you know 
Africa with unity and, and AI and whatever, and he's got no resources, but he's got the coolest idea and he's super creative and he's able to put it together. Like, do you want to demonize this person for using the most cutting edge technology to produce something completely new and novel? Like it's, this is interesting philosophical territory that we're in right now, you know, when it, with, with any emerging technology, like, do we, does the world like email? You know, do we like to use email? Have we destroyed the traditional postman job? Have we killed a lot of jobs there? You know, that's probably the closest corollary I can think of in terms of a tech that is going to eliminate people and like Luddites smashing machines. Is that really the way forwards? Is that where we are? I don't think so. Um, the, the, I'm not a complete alarmist. I'm amazed by the technology. Like it's it's incredible. But mm -hmm. we're also like, more nascent with AI now than say where the World Wide Web was in like 1996, like Netscape Navigator days. I don't think we're even at Netscape Navigator when it comes to chat GPT. Oh, Zach. Um, <laughs> ask, ask a question. Sorry, Matt. I'm like a gopher and <laughs> mosaic. Even. That's it. We, wow. We're at the BBS days, you know? Um, so let's see where we are 10, 15 years from now. Let's see when, when AI is like, Picking up, um, hey, this looks like a trends of a, a cholera outbreak. I don't know, whatever. I'm just making up examples here where it's where it's like undeniable net positive. And I think we're all like so scared of how does this undermine art? How does this undermine creativity? How are people going to lose their jobs? This is the worst thing ever. Like, don't get your opinions of is there a AI friend? And social like, media. Like, dig I mean, a little if bit I could to, If I could use ChatGPT or whatever it would be called, you know, if I said, here's, I want you to make a game, set it in Australia, uh, base it on sort of Fallout and Wasteland. And, you know, if I'm imagining that it's going to give me a game better than <laughs> Broken Roads, I just don't, I can, do you see that ever happening? Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I saw something really yesterday game where game somebody game. had taken, uh, made, I think it was the Mona Lisa put on a COVID mask using AI and like, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, we'll see, man. Like, every every new technology, I think, has pros and cons. Um, but you there's certain things you just won't stop. Like, you can't stop that, that era of progress or whatever. And um, I think if you also just, like, step back and go, like, is this the end of the world? Is this the latest, like walking around with a sandwich board, the end is nigh? Like that's the way people are treating AI and creative, you know, the games industry and that kind of thing. When it's like, well, no, what you can do is you can, let's say there's a job that takes six hours and you can get a computer to, to reduce that to three hours. And that's three additional hours that of, of idle time of whatever that you're able to put into your creative stuff. Yeah. You know, I remember something you know, last point in this 20 ish years ago, uh, when they started getting surfboard shaping machines that would do the, they would cut because surfboards are always handcrafted and like custom made to the, for the individual and so on. They got machines that would cut out the foam and it would take off like 80, 90% of the grinding foam by hand. But then the final touches were always done by it by the shaper, you know, the final sanding, the glassing, like all those last little touches. And that's really what matters. So like, why does the human need to grind all the foam down to for like three hours and get tennis elbow and do all these things when a machine can do that? And there was an outcry of like, no, this is a, this is, this is killing the art of surfboard, you know, shaping and that kind of thing. And I see a lot of the same stuff kind of much louder because we didn't have social media in those days much louder, much more angry around AI, where it's like, well, the surfboards are better, you know, there's people are producing more of them. And all you've done is reduced some of the repetitive human tasks, uh, allowing more freedom for R&D and fun and exploration and, 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 and trying things out. So I'm definitely, if anything, like on the more excited to see where we go as opposed to storm the building, you know, storm the Bastille and burn it down and like don't even think about AI. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a big issue. You know, I've talked about it with a lot of different people on the show. And it's, it's interesting to hear that all these perspectives on it. Hmm. I mean, I guess for me, I think about the, I think a lot of 
are thinking about, say, well, I don't know, I know about it mostly from the writer's perspective, because it's mostly what I do. And there's this idea that I think kind of a romantic conception that's been around for a long time about what an author does. And it's like yes. this, it's got this original originality or inspired, just distinctly human and all this. So there's a lot of people that believe that. Uh, but then there's this, if you look, if you pick up any manual or any guidebook about how do I become a novelist or how do I get to write, how do I write a best-selling uh, fiction? <laughs> you know, the advice is always read a lot of best-selling novels, read as much as you can, study them, learn their techniques. And Hold up your corpus. And I'm like, how is this different than what this AI is doing? I mean, it's, you're just feeding it the corpus and it's, you know, analyzing. It. It's probably doing the same thing that's happening in the author's head. Yeah. Now, why else would you yeah. need to read all these best-selling novels? I mean, what, you know, if that was, if the romantic view was true, you'd be saying, don't read anything. <laughs> totally. Like, like really, now, if you, if you know the, the philosophical, I know it's a philosophical concept, but that's why I encountered it. Differences in kind and differences in degree. Is a calculator an adding machine? Is that not just the simplest version of what chat GPT is? And if like an accountant uses a calculator, are they, are they like undermining the essence of what it means to be an accountant? And, you know, or, or you can say, no, well, mathematics and numbers are very, very different to verbal and artistic pursuits, but but I think you're externalizing the heavy lifting to a thing that was nothing but the creation of human ingenuity in the first place. And you've got in, you've got in like stones, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you've, you've made a thing from the world that now simulates the actions of the human mind. You know, you've got, you've gone from abacus to calculator through human ingenuity. Now we have machines that can, you know, write me a describe, talky in the style of Ernest Hemingway or right broken roads, you know, uh, excuse me, country roads and as broken roads. These are extensions of the same thing. We are scratching the surface of a new technology. You can run in fear. You can try and burn it down, kill it with fire. It's new and it's scary. Or you can just go sit back, open a beer. Let's see what happens. You know, if Skynet starts to form, cool, we'll 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 form the resistance and we'll fight back if that, if that ends up happening. But nah, man, stay, stay off social media and your life will be a whole lot better and your opinions on things will probably be a whole lot more grounded too. Boom, that's a great ending for this, I think. <laughs> well, thanks again for doing this. It's been a lot of Oh, fun. Matt, this has been a, a real pleasure. I really have enjoyed chatting to you and, you know, that um, shared interest in RPGs and philosophy and so on and um your openness to hey maybe this game isn't a total dumpster fire based upon <laughs> launch reviews <laughs> it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah that was just yeah i hate that happened to you mm. it, look it's 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 been like i said some moments like a waking nightmare where you can't go like this is worse than the worst publisher forecast that we saw like this is the worst case scenario wow like okay i've got a lot to learn game director, studio founder, you know, leading the team, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I can't offset everything to, ah, oh, it was unfair reviews. Like, oh, lawyer fucked me and I'm in prison. Like, it's not, I can't take that approach. Um, there is a balance somewhere between what did I do wrong and what are circumstances beyond our control and, and we're figuring out what we can fix. And like I said, let's just hope that this is a snowball now of positive reviews and things turn around. But then they will. Yeah. Cheers, man. Okay. I'll let you go. Thanks a lot. And totally side note, love the stuff you've been doing for years. Uh, loved your passion for RPGs. Loved the channel. Read a lot of your stuff. Um, and you got to send, like, send me your hoodies. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll have to. <laughs> um, like, you do really, really cool stuff with the CRPG. I don't want to say community, but like the COPG world and COPG devs and stuff like that, man. It's, it's awesome to see and really stoked to uh, have be, find myself now suddenly part of the content you create. It's like, oh shit, I actually did that. Like we made a COPG and Matt's interested in our stuff now. That's pretty cool. That's all for this week's episode. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. 
I uh, got a lot of uh, really fun stuff coming up in the pipes. I'm thinking about doing a, uh, a video of that Wizardry remake I've talked about uh, last video. I'm kind of torn between that. I could do a Broken Roads uh, game. I want to do another uh, Let's Play video. <laughs> so, uh, so let me know if there's anything in particular that you think I should cover. Uh, maybe I should go back a little retro, do something older uh, instead of an indie game. But uh, whatever's clever, just let me know what you think would be fun. Uh, I'd be happy to do it because I do all this for you, my friend. Yes, yes, you. <laughs> I do it for you. Uh, but look, uh, we're in a lot of trouble here. Uh, we've been struggling, Matt Bradley Shergi and I, we've been trying and trying and trying. Whatever we can do, throwing uh, all the stuff against the wall, hoping something will stick. Can we get the subs up? Can we get the Patreon uh, fund back where it needs to be to make this sustainable again? You know, we've kind of been treading water. Uh, we've been bailing uh, water, treading water, you know, doing all uh, kinds of bad stuff with water. So, uh, I need your help. If you want to keep Matt Chat on the air, keep these shows coming, just take a minute, go to that Patreon site. Uh, if you haven't done so already, it's only I only ask for one dollar. If, if, if everybody watched the show, put in a dollar, uh, we'd be set. But unfortunately, it's just not the case. So we have to depend on really nice people like you uh, to make up uh, the difference on that. So if you've got a little, if you like Matt Chat and you got a little extra cash, no, you're not strapped. I don't want to take uh, anybody's uh, rent money here. Uh, but if you have a little extra, wouldn't mind donating and uh, please go to that link in the show notes to the patreon site matt and i would greatly 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 appreciate it oh my god would we appreciate it so please do so and thank you uh, all right what about that news from the matt game oh that news from the matt Cave. Oh man, a lot of stuff here. Let's see, where shall we start? Should I start with the first item? Yeah. Uh, so Miko, Miko wrote in about a game called Monsters of Mikan. M-I-C-A-N. Mikan. Mikan? What is Mikan? Is that like a something to do with geology? Uh, uh, a whimsical, party-based, first-person turn-based dungeon crawler RPG a.k.a. a blubber. Uh, discover the origin of monsters in Mikan as you explore unique handcrafted dungeons, battle, or befriend hundreds of diverse monsters, learn dozens of spells, and find tons of secrets and loot. Game heavily inspired by might and magic and wizardry with plenty of modern flair and heaps of qual, Q-O-L, features. <laughs> so grandiose. <laughs> Quality of life features. Okay. Uh, basically means nice interface. <laughs> uh, anyway, this game, you can pick it up now. It's from Blanket, Blank It Productions for only $7.50. Apparently, this has been getting a lot of discussion over at the Codex. All right, then Matt Bradley Shurgi, uh, you know him. He writes in about a game called Ale Abbey. And uh, you know I like my ales. Well, this is a game about <laughs> Abbey Ales, which is the best kind of ale. Uh, build and expand your monastery, craft recipes, and brew holy ales in this unique brewery tycoon. No pre-made recipes. It's a canvas for true beer alchemists. It's as simple as brew, sip, repeat. <laughs> uh, this is probably a little bit easier than maybe a real life home brew. Uh, although if you are really a big fan of beer, I think you should, at some point in your life, uh, you know, jump in, make a little homebrew. You, know, you can buy a kit pretty cheap. It's a lot of fun, and you get to learn about how beer is made, and uh, you can experiment. I did that for quite a while. Uh, it's a lot of fun, but uh, short of that, <laughs> here's the game, El Abbey. All right, and then Potty uh, writes in about uh, well, basically a cell going on. Uh, so you probably know Resident Evil 1 got a nice remake. Uh, well, GOG now has a bundle where you can get the first three uh, games. They're all going to be remade eventually. Uh, you can pick it up now for $25, $24.99. Uh, you get the first one now, and then as the second and third ones are released, they'll automatically add that to the library. So a pretty good deal if you are a fan of the Resident Evil series. Uh, and then finally, Becky Berger, a long-term friend of the show, uh, now, she's done uh, Luxor Evolved uh, for Switch, Xbox One, PlayStation, and maybe some other <laughs> systems I haven't noted here. Uh, and that's uh, $20, uh, at least the one on the Switch is. 
Uh, let's see. Luxor Evolve builds on the instantly engaging gameplay of the original game with 65 unique levels, reimagined gameplay, stunning visual effects, and uh, interactive soundtracks. Number one arcade shooter with tons of action to keep the challenges coming. So check that out. You know, you don't always want a <laughs> computer role-playing game experience. Sometimes you want something with a little bit more uh, uh, action, I guess. A little more shooting. <laughs> a little more classic arcade-style gameplay. So uh, anyway, grats, Becky, on getting that product out. All right, speaking of ales, though, uh, what about that ale of the week? Well, I'm back to, I uh, got a couple more of these... Uh, Untitled art selections from my uh, little bundle of uh, uh, micro brews I picked up uh, from direct, direct from the company. This is the Citra Haze. I uh, so remember last time I had the Juicy Haze. <laughs> so I assume the Citra refers to Citra hops, uh, which is pretty aptly named, in my experience. Let's see, did it give me any information here about it? Uh, not seeing anything. Five grams of sugar. Now let's go ahead and pour it into the this glass here. Yeah, so I redid my redid my shelves a little bit here. I've been thinking about replacing these with some glass cabinets. Uh, it's a little bit pricey, but it would keep the dust out because I'm always having to dust off all these boxes and stuff. <laughs> just a just a thought. All right, let's look at the Citra Haze. Citra Haze. You know, all of these have an excellent presentation. Really nice uh, head on this. Just hundreds, if not thousands, of little tiny bubbles coming out of this. Nice color on it. You know, you definitely smell the hops on this one. Now, I'm not good enough. I don't know if I'd be able to just smell something and tell you what kind of hops are in there. You know, maybe I'll get there one day, but uh, it definitely smells citrusy. Kind of that. A little bit of a nutty uh, citrusy flavor on this, uh, or aroma on this, I should say. Uh, just smells really good, not overpowering by any means. Uh, just a good, good healthy aroma. Let's pour some into the rather excellent drinking horn. And give it a proper swig. Do, 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 do. All right. <laughs> I'll try it again. Yeah, these, you know, I'm starting to think uh, with this untitled art, uh, maybe they got just really lucky with that s'mores dark brew, because <laughs> that one just absolutely knocked that out of the park. Uh, and I, I was expecting these other ones to be really, really good, but, you know, they're, they're basically okay. I'll try this one. You know, it's not bad. It's just, uh, I, I can tell right away this is a non-alcoholic brew. Uh, it doesn't have that bite. You know, it's like it smells like a beer, tastes a little bit like a beer, a little bit uh, more watery is kind of how I describe uh, uh, that. Probably not the best term, sounds kind of negative, but, uh, you know, there's just none of that that bite, that punch uh, that you want with a, good, with a good ale. I think they probably could... Uh, up the uh, hop factor on this a little bit, but you know, okay. <laughs> uh, it's not terrible by any means. Uh, it's just, you know, you're going to be able to tell this is a non alcoholic uh, beer. Uh, you know, tastes all right. <laughs> I keep coming back though. <laughs> you know, if you want a non alcoholic, uh, you know, if you don't mind that it doesn't have alcohol in it, there's a, a really good sparkling water <laughs> from the Surly Company uh, with zero calories, zero everything. Uh, it's just some basically hop. Uh, sparkling water that to me tastes just as good as this uh, and is zero everything but uh, if you want something a little bit more beer like I guess in color <laughs> uh, you can go with this yeah uh, it's just okay you know nothing's really standing out to me with this you know if I'd have had the wherewithal I really should have gone to the store and picked up a nice uh, some of those Australian ales <laughs> that Craig recommended uh, maybe I'll do that next time. But uh, anyway, for now, the Citra Haze uh, from Untitled Art. You know, I might go two, three out of five uh, drinking horns on this in terms of uh, non-alcohols. You know, there's just a lot of better. There's a lot, a lot better uh, NAs out there you, you could try. Uh, but who knows? You might really like this. You know, tastes are different. 
All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was uh, looking for quotes about failure. <laughs> You know, it's kind of why I wore this uh, shirt. I don't know how well you're able to see this, but uh, it's about a band, or the shirt is uh, from a band named Anvil. And they've got a documentary uh, that's kind of like Spinal Tap. You know, you think you're going to be watching some kind of a remake of Spinal Tap or some different version of it. Uh, it seems kind of like a comedy, but then you realize that, no, this is serious. This is a serious uh, rockumentary about this band named Anvil. You know, and they, they fall on hard times. They've been trying and trying and trying, you know, to make it big and just can't ever seem to break through. Uh, even though at the very beginning of their career, they had a lot of a uh, lot of success. But uh, I always found it kind of an inspirational movie. You know, you got to always kind of appreciate the people that are just willing to stick to something, uh, even though they don't, <laughs> the success and victory keeps eluding them, but they, you know, they keep on showing up at the track, you know, anyway. Uh, there's just something kind of uh, heroic about that. Uh, in my opinion. Uh, but anyway, I found a great quote uh, from Dennis uh, Waitley, a motivational speaker, so you'd expect it to be motivating. Uh, it goes something like this. Failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Failure is delay, not defeat. It is a temporary detour, not a dead end. Failure is something we can avoid only by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. I love that. <laughs> anyway, folks, ponder on that, and I'll see you guys next time. you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder. These go to 11. <laughs>